Today we have a special guest, John Wedger, ex-police officer and anti-child abuse campaigner. campaigner. Yeah. Yes, mate. Sorry, man. But you know what? It's because I'm dyslectic, yeah? yeah? It's hard to register that information. And that always the first thing that gets me on podcasts is that first opening part. Also, whistleblower. Whistleblower, yeah. Yeah, so it, like that always, that always, that first bit always gets me. But you'll see we'll flow into it, you know? But um, yeah, it sucks Well, sometimes. it's a convoluted title anyway, you know? Uh, but it, it's all interconnected. Yeah, it's got me massively intrigued, man. Tell me a little bit about yourself and, and where you go with this. Yeah, so I'm, I'm retired from the Metropolitan Police. I did 25 years service. Um, got pensioned off, but the circumstances of me leaving the police are acrimonious ones. Um, I, I worked in many fields, but I specialised in child abuse. And it wasn't something that I, I really wanted to go into. It's something that life took me that way. So I always say the children found me. I never found the children, you know? Yeah. And I brought up four kids on my own. So I was a single parent. I didn't want to deal with anyone else's dysfunctional kids. I had enough of my own to deal with. Um, but I, I kept just getting dragged back towards kids and, and child abuse investigations. Was that the job or was that you that kept getting dragged? I don't back? know what it was. I think I, I now know that it was it, it was God doing it. But um, the, the, the job, I, I'm, I deliberately thought, no, I'm, I'm not going to deal with it. Um, but I was working at one place and I had a brilliant detective sergeant. And he said, listen, there's, we need someone to do covert work, tracking down paedophiles, transient paedophiles. Um, and funny enough, I ended up in this sort of part of the world, Peterborough, you know, um, is where it took me, which was strange. And he said, look, they're losing people when they come out of prison and they're meant to register as paedophiles and they're going missing and the government can't have it. So we need to track them down. And uh, do you want a job? And I went, okay. He said, but it's unique in as much as we want you to find ones that are living on boats, canal boats. I went, okay. He said, we think we got two. If you can find another two in the next few months, you know, brilliant. It works. So I said, okay. He said, look, it, it, the paedophile unit at Scotland Yard is sponsoring you. You're going to be seconded to them. It's a national um, thing. But no one knows what to do so you make up as you go along and there was an article in the paper from a copper in in peterborough and he was successful in tracking down transient paedophiles so i thought well i'll go to what works always go to what works yeah, never yeah. go to what doesn't so i said well why peterborough why have you got so many and it was all to do with peterborough is four hours from dover and people think well so what geographical profiling a lorry four hours has to stop for its tachograph. So it comes off the ferry. Usually the main route is up, you know, the A1. Yeah. Uh, and then these lorries stop, and they're usually in Peterborough, and that's when people start jumping out. Well, right. I never would have even thought about that. No, and exactly. It's geographical profiling, and it's it's one of the things I, I ended up dealing with geographical profiling, criminal profiling, and all these elements. I was so privileged to meet these experts in it and work closely with them. It changed my total way of thinking. Mate, that must have just enlightened, like opened your mind up, yeah. and blown your mind. It, and and it's it's a pattern. It's it's like a chaos theory that there there is a pattern, an algorithm in everything we do. And once I started understanding that, I become hugely successful very very quickly. Um, and just understanding the human mind. And but the the sex offenders were, were a different breed because they're a very devious mind. You know, a very deceptive mind, and they evade prosecution and recognition and everything because of what they're doing is so wrong um, they're like sly they're like snakes you know and you, you found that with normal criminals there would be this um sort of 
college of criminality that they go through. So when they start off with a small, you know, and work their way up to the big, and it's years and years of, of progression. So they'll go from minor violence to major violence, from minor theft to major theft, into organised crime, violence linking in with, with, with theft, you know, so you're going to get the armed robberies and boom. So it's this progressive element. With the sex offenders, you don't get that. Um, with the sex offenders, they tend to be under the radar and, and avoid prosecution. If they do have convictions, it tends to be for deception because it's a very devious, deceptive mind. So I started understanding the thinking of it. And what happened um, was that instead of finding two more sex offenders within a short period of time, and they were going to live on canal boats, you know, and they were um, evading detection because they were transient, they were moving about yeah. and living on these boats. But they were also getting themselves involved with respite care for special needs kids, um, doing trips to the zoo on canal boats for kids. A lot of special needs kids were getting targeted and wayward children because they would gravitate towards boats, yeah. being outdoors and all that. And these perverts were there waiting. But at the same time, the BBC brought out a, a program uh, called Rosie and Jim. Yeah. About these two little rag dolls that lived on a canal boat. And of course, it, kids started... Rose and Jim, so the paedophiles are actually putting these dolls in, in boats and they then become an indicator to, to other paedophiles, whether a person liked a girl, which would be Rosie or Jim, the boy, or both. Yeah. So they started, which they used to do with Action Man and Barbie right. dolls. Like, I used to watch Rosie and Jim yeah. and I would never, like, now you've said it, I think to myself, wow. Yeah, well, what happened was, in, in a month, I found 90. 96 offenders, like, flipping hell. All in Peterborough? No, Peterborough, I came to Peterborough because the guy who worked in the copper was an expert in, in how to locate transient paedophiles. Mm. And I've worked with him in understanding the paedophile and how they move about. And then I brought that mindset and that knowledge into London mm -hmm. and I started working on the canal system and realised this is a network, a heavily organised network of paedophiles, and they were highly dangerous. These are these are people that were some were planning to abduct, mutilate kids, um, and and again, it sort of opened my my thought process to to there's two two aspects of law, and there's what they call actus reus and mens reus. So actus reus is the actual physical element of doing a crime. The mens reus is the intention. Right, the mental. So it's Latin terms, you know. But it's a the mental mindset, you know, the in, criminal intent. And what I found was that with the sex offender, what they um, present themselves is a very fine veneer. But you get under that veneer, you've got an absolute killer, you know, a monster. And it's all to do with opportunity. And we've just seen that with this guy that's just been convicted. The, the Metropolitan Police Officer, the, you know, the armed response um, officer, um, Wayne Cousins, with this girl called Sarah Everard, who he abducted, you know, and then, then mutilated her. And I said to someone, because it came out, and this was the indicator for me, that, that he had been caught um, exposing himself, getting his, his penis out in a McDonald's. And as soon as they said that, I said to someone, he's a killer. That man's a killer. He's, he's a killer, and he maybe have done her, but definitely maybe more. And we said, how do you know it? Because of that that flashing, right? And when your criminally profile flashes, men expose themselves. Um, all that it takes is for an opportunity, and they will rape, abduct, rape, and possibly kill. From exposure that, of, of their being? That, that quickly. And it will all depend on how the person reacts and the opportunity. So that person, when he gets his, his cock out in the street, his intention is, is abduction, rape, and murder. Really? Yep, yep. And it's not, oh, I want to just show and be cheeky and show my willy. And I, it's deeper than that. And this is what you start finding with sex offenders. Um, the, the Americans do it a lot. I work with, with one of the FBI profilers and have done for quite a long time, a Belgium lady. And she's, um, she has just called France's most prolific child murderer on her own. And, but she identified him in 2003, and she said he's a detective with the Paris um, 
police. No way. And in 2003, she told them, this is, this is a profile. This man is a detective. He works in this zone of Paris. This is his MO. This is how he operates. He's going to kill and kill and kill. They ignored her. And it was only when the ninth victim was found, they went back to her and she was bang on right. And they said, what do we do? And she said, you DNA this cluster from 2000s onwards, everyone, and you'll find your man. And they drafted in, the police wouldn't listen, but a local magistrate took it on and demanded that these detectives, past and present, all got DNA'd. One went missing, she said, that's your murderer. And it was, he was found hanging, and he left a note admitting to all the murders, nine of them. Wow. And she profiled him all these years back. So I've been privileged to work with her for many years, this woman now, and I learned so much from her and many others. Um, but, but sex offending is, without a doubt, the single biggest threat, you know, to our society. And it doesn't get a look in, you know. And child abuse, when you, when you look at 80% of the prison population come from abused, not sexually abused per se, but abused childhood background. Yeah, I've tried to background. notice that within yep. the podcast that I've been you doing. Will. You that um, uh, abuses from a, from a very young age is very relevant. And the thing is, with it, Paul, how does how does a child process this? You know, especially when a kid is put in care and is is then subject to brutality and sexual abuse and rape. Um, it's going to manifest itself in extreme trauma, which the system will never address because it, it's not looking for it and it don't want to hear it and it's ill-equipped to deal with it. So that becomes anger. Mm. And then that anger goes through life, and that's when the violence comes in. And, you, you know, you, you'll see that with, with a lot. So what I do now is I work uh, with victims and survivors. I know one of them's a good friend of the show, Anthony mm-hmm. Roberts. Of, yeah, uh, Anthony Roberts. You know, an ex arm robber, phenomenal. Massive love They need for to that make crime. a film about his life. Yeah. Cause it's, um, but, but a good human being, you know. And, and I've just introduced him to um, to a police officer who does a lot of talks in care homes and I said to this couple you've got to get this lad talking 100%. to these children because he his story is, is one that perfectly fits so much in the anger uh, you know and everything else so when we also look at our prison system fails it fails 80% of the time so I was I was given a talk to um, to a group and I said right if I was a builder and you wanted an extension. And I say, right, I'm going to provide the builders. They're going to be £450 per hour. You're going to be charged for every phone call they make, every fax they send, every email they send, you're going to be charged 50 quid for that, right? Um, And once they've done their work, 80% of all the buildings they put up collapse immediately, right? I said, are you still going to contract me? And they're like, well, of course not. I said, but why? Because this is the government's answer to criminal justice, recidivism, reoffending. Solicitors, 450 quid an hour. They charge for faxes. They charge for, for emails, for, for this. They, they charge for it all. And what do they do? Do they bring about any justice? No. Does a prison system bring about any justice? No. It, any, any end to it, breaking the cycle. Whereas when we go to the Scandinavian model, it works. Because mm. they go back to childhood, you know? So when you've got 80% of prisons have come from a backgrounds that are abused, you've got to go back to them years. And it's the same when you deal with sex offenders. There's always a way in, right, to these people. And it's always an emotional way in because these are emotionally retarded individuals. When, when they were damaged, because let's get this right, there is a degree of people that get hurt that go on to hurt. Not all of them, by far, mm. no. Um, and it depends if a woman sexually abused someone, there's a great deal more uh, percentage and probability they're going to go on to abuse than if a man has abused a boy. It's a strange thing because women, when women sexually offend, it's done with a veracity and spite that you don't get with men. So there is a difference between a, a female and a male paedophile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, you will get paedophiles in every age category, uh, in every colour. In every religion, you know, I, I talk in Parliament and I give these talks and I give presentations um, and I've been in front of, of leaders of all the faiths and it's amazing, 
there are still faiths out there that, that refuse to accept that they are paedophiles in positions of power within their faith. And it, 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 that, that is not, like, that is it's so, like, oh, I don't even know how to say it. There is more in power than what you realise, isn't Yeah, yeah uh, well, because, I mean, we, we, we can split it down, right? And then you start getting... You get the sexual abuse. So I've dealt with a lot of people that have come from the care system. The care system is a monumentally, fundamentally failed system. It doesn't care for them. There are good people out there that have cared for, for broken children. Mm -hmm. And God bless them. Mm -hmm. God bless them. You know, but there are others who do it for money. Mm -hmm. They just see the children as a commodity. Unfortunately, the system perpetuates that uh, and allows for that. And that's wrong. You see it advertised as a career move, you know, on buses. You could foster kids all about the money, the shekel, you know, and it's wrong. Uh, you had organised care homes, big the big ones that they used to call like cottage homes, like Bernardo's. I mean, yeah. these things were, were sprung up in the eighteen hundreds, and and they went on and on and on throughout into really like the nineties. These big acreages of land, self-contained. Um, but we're just seeing now the government inquiries into the abuse that went on in these places. I mean, there was one in South London that had no nineteen known paedophiles working for them producing thousands and thousands of victims that went on to have very dysfunctional, damaged lives, you know? And it was allowed. And it become like a Disney world for paedophiles. Uh, you've got ones like Shirley Oaks, Beach Home, Medemsey. There's You can rattle them off with, with organised child abuse in there and nothing was ever done. Reports went in time and time again and, of course, the victims were, were, were denigrated for speaking out. You know, they were you know you go back to the 60s and the 70s they were whipped they were mm. caned and it was put on their their record that this is a liar and of course one of the things that um subdues abuse is drugs heroin being the main one because it's an analgesic and what does an analgesic do it it curtails pain it takes pain down um so a lot of heroin addicts are harboring a lot of pain a hell yeah. of a lot of pain. And, um, of course, this drug, boom, it does it. So how are they treating heroin addicts? They're treating them the wrong way. You know, they need to find out what's caused that. You know, so a heroin addict has to pay for his drugs because goodwill only goes so far and savings only go so mm -hmm. far. So men will commit crimes such as robbery and shoplifting. Women, it's prostitution. Yeah, right? prostitution and shoplifting is, yeah. is very prolific yeah. when it comes to um, uh, affording the addiction. Yeah, and, and of course, it's a daily addiction, yeah. and, and it's a monster that needs constantly funding. Now, you might be the best shoplifter going, and, and you might be the, the, the cutest prostitute going, but you're going to get caught at some point, you know, and the deeper you get into addiction, the more chance you're going to get caught, especially now with CCTV and ASBO and everything else. So... This heroin addict is caught, taken to a police station. Now, there's two ways you can deal with this. You can turn around and say, this is a pain in the arse, this person. Uh, you know, they're scum. They're going around j just chawing out of our shops, left, right and centre. Uh, bang, bang them up, lock, lock them away, let's get rid of them. They're just a nuisance, a menace. And when I used to train police officers, I used to turn around and say, however, this could be a very minor offence which we dealt with in a magistrate court, get banged up and everyone's happy. Or this victim, who's a shoplifter and a heroin addict and homeless, you know, um, and everything else, they potentially could give you information that will unlock the biggest crime you'll ever deal with, organised paedophilia. And this is where I made my success. So I started talking to heroin addicts, go, well, what happened? And they would tell you, I was in a care home. I was abused, boom, 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 boom. And of course they were putting their records, you know, this is a liar, this is a fantasy. And then when you start committing crimes such as shoplifting, it's a crime of dishonesty. Yeah. And in 2003, they changed the law and they, um, they brought in a thing called bad character. And they could bring in all your previous history during a trial. Before they couldn't do this, you know. And so all of a sudden, this little heroin addict wants to start talking about being in a care home where he was abused uh, by the staff, and then there were celebrities coming in, which we, we know happened, right? Elm guest house for one, politicians coming in. People were recognising politicians on the telly. 
that was a man that came in. One of the biggest ones was Lord Janna, you know, very, very prominent uh, peer, uh, highly respected in the Jewish community because of his work against the Nazis, but one of the most prolific paedophiles this country's ever had. Um, I know one guy recognised him and went, that man there, he's a paedophile. I know who he is. He used to come into care homes and rape us. But all of a sudden, the defence team will turn around and say, well, this, how can we trust this person? They're a liar. Yeah. They're a dishonest person. Their character is one of dishonesty. Yeah. They are a liar. And we can prove they're a liar because in school they lied. In the care home they lied. They were always making up excuses. And this is a battle you've got, but it doesn't mean you can't win, you know. Unfortunately, um, a historic child abuse case has got a 2% success rate. So there's no impetus wow. and there's a lot of hard work goes into it. And you're dealing with very damaged people. And you're dealing with people that can turn on you as well because of the trauma and everything else. But what do you do? You ignore it? Do you give up or do you turn around and fight back? Now, I started looking into these cases and it was like, I've never seen, I've worked with deception, right, amongst the Nigerian community who were like, the and again, this is, this is a statistical thing. You should deal with passport deceptions. 90% of them were made by Nigerians. It was a very much organised criminality. The passports were worth a lot of money and there was a, a whole way of scamming to get passports. And then anyone who's dealt with um, deceptions, especially in the Nigerian community, it's hard going. You know, you yeah. really got to know this stuff. And, and I've worked with very complex deceptions and all that. Um, so I sort of understood it. Um, and you know how you can open a can of worms, as they say, but I, I was ill prepared um, for what I was to encounter in opening, lifting this stone, opening this Pandora's box when it comes to child abuse. Because I started getting warned, be careful, be careful. Who are you to be careful of? Well, politicians. So I was warned by one very, very seasoned, experienced Scotland Yard paedophile detective, one of the premier ones, a good guy. He said, you be careful, John. He said, because any other criminality, um, you get praised for doing good. When you look at this sort of crime, the opposite happens. And then he went on to tell me about members of the cabinet, home secretaries, all sorts that were involved in, in the organised sexual abuse and rape of children. Wow. Right. And he said, when their names cropped up, special branch come in, the intelligence services come in, shut, oh. us, shut us down, bang, right? So I was like, well, okay. And he said, your name's now getting mentioned in, in the corridors at Scotland Yard because of this operation that was on. It was too successful. He said, I'm warning you, and I'll only warn you once, John, be careful. Within a day, I was removed from the unit, the job was shut down, and it was highly successful, highly successful. Even the intelligence today is still being used. It was that It was that long-standing. And at that point, I thought, this is a conspiracy. What's going on? So I was dragged in by a senior officer, and he said, oh, we need you elsewhere, John, you to be taken off it because it's an economic problem. And I went, oh, come on, please, because I've been told, you know. And he went, listen, look, I'm going to be honest with you, right, because I, I, I like you and I trust you. And he said, it's come from very high up. We're to shut you down. And he said, pick a job and you'll get it. And I said, right, well, I want to carry on working with child abuse because I realised it was highly beneficial and it was covering something up. Um, and I started at that point working with ex-criminals. They started talking to me and offering their help. And this is where I first got to hear about an ex-gangster called Chris Lambriano, um, who was, like, a, a, in his day, a feared man, yeah. an enforcer for, I mean, he'd be very good to get on, on your show. He's a, a good guy. I'd love you if you got that link. Yeah, right? yeah, I, I'll speak to Chris. He's a, a good man. And I know he's done stuff with Anthony Roberts as well. Um, and his testimony is incredible, you know, and he does a lot for, for survivors of abuse, especially the ones that are adults that are living in rehab centres. He's, he, he's incredible the work he's done. Um, so I sort of got put in touch with him, and but they wouldn't let him come in and give a talk because they said he's, he's like blacklisted because he's a, an ex-criminal. This was back then. It's different now. Um, so I sort of 
let that one go for a few years and I got a job with, with the vice unit and I started working on the street with the, the prostitutes and again, all come from the care homes, every one of them, every one of them on heroin, every one of them have been sexually abused, every one of them have been adopted and abused, fostered out and abused, every single one. And then we started coming across young girls and I mean young girls um, and they were on heroin and crack cocaine and I remember dragging a little girl in one night. I saw her on the street and uh, she was 14 years old and she was very underweight. She was only little, but she was very underweight. She was on heroin, crack cocaine. She had all sorts of life-threatening contagions such as tuberculosis, hepatitis, HIV. Um, oh, at such a young age. You young, know. yeah. And I said, come on, let's take this little girl into care. And then I was told, get rid of her. I went, why? And I went, she's got scabies. And she'll infect the car with scabies. And she'll only do it again tomorrow anyway, so just get rid of her. And I didn't. I took her back. You know? Value of human life, eh? Yeah, it's nothing. It's nothing. You know, they're more worried about the car being off the road because of scabies than this little kid. So um, I thought, well, that's wrong. And then a little girl come forward. And again, it took me to this part of the world. I ended up sort of up here and they were taking the kids and putting them in secure units and a lot of them were, were up in Cambridgeshire, Lincolnshire and all that and this little girl said I, I really want to talk um, to a police officer about what happened to me in London and she'd been told to F off a couple of times by the police and she kept protesting so I said I'll, I'll go and see her and they went well she's a bit of a nightmare, um, she kicks off a lot and she's, to be honest she's horrible. And I went, well, give me a chance. So I go up to the secure unit and, and I see her. And uh, she's a little girl, quiet, butch, you know, um, and she was mouthy, you know. But we we got a rapport and we got chatting. And she started telling me stuff and she said, Look, I'm being pimped out. And it's not me, there's loads, there's loads of us. And we're taken on the street, this street in Paddington, and we're hidden in bushes. And it was a woman that was doing it. And this woman was a known prostitute. And there had been rumours, because I've been in briefings, where they were fearing she was connected to young girls, this prostitute. Her name was Foxy, Fiona. And she was a larger-than-life character, um, quite an attractive girl, um, very streetwise. And she could manipulate people, you know? It's one of them things where the tail would never wag the dog with her. She, she did the wagging, you know? Yeah. And... Um, uh, this girl was saying, you know, police officers go and nick her, but she lets them look. She lets them look up her skirt. They pull her skirt up and look at her knickers, and she lets them touch them up. She said, "I've seen them do it," and she said, and she hides us in the bushes. So she had this little legion of young girls, uh, all of which whose parents were drug addicts, and she was pimping them out. It's, and, like, a, it's like a pattern, isn't it? Like. Um, yeah. You know, start start um, grooming the, the the troubled ones. Yeah, and this is how they get. You see, see, one of the things I talk about, as I mentioned earlier, I was a single parent, and I'm staunch against single parenting. I said, don't do it, don't do it, don't have kids unless you're married and you're in love. Don't do it because you weaken your family, yeah. and it allows these vultures to come in, and especially when you've got problems, social issues, mental health issues, poverty issues, right. And, and the drugs come in and dysfunctionality comes in, it's the kids who suffer, you know, and they become prey. So a kid who's coming from poverty and dysfunctionality is six times more likely to be trafficked for sex. And most of the trafficking occurs in their family environs, you know, so they know that's a weakness there and they can prey on these kids. And we hear a lot about grooming gangs and all that. It's a bit on vogue and it is a reality because I get attacked all the time for not saying, blaming it all on the Muslims. Let's get this right. There are Muslim grooming gangs. 100% there are. There are Jamaican grooming gangs. There yeah. are Lithuanian grooming gangs. The biggest grooming gang in this country, fact, fact, comes from the home. 80% of all grooming and trafficking occurs in the home. Yeah, and it's yeah. always someone that you, um, someone that they know as well. Always. And and do you know when? Um, and this is something I wanted to ask because you know you, your specialities in in the field of it. When if 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 someone that you know has done it, yeah, and they've had no intentions whatsoever, but they've 
created some form of like um, what they feel is um, closeness to uh, someone that is within the family and they've done something. Had they already had that in them? Yeah, the intention's there. Has it always been there? Um, well, it, well it, everything's on an individual basis. But, I mean, what, what is their intention on, on being nice to a kid? I mean, you should be nice to a kid because it's what the, Progression of growth. the good thing is. Yeah. Be nice to kids. Why would you be horrible to kids? Mm. Take a dog. You, you get a puppy dog, you know. Now, you can either give that dog an easy life, a nice life, a loving life, or you can be a horror to it, a bastard to it. The choice is yours. That dog hasn't got a choice. You know, so you, if I got that dog and I stuck fireworks up its ass and lit them and I booted it and I didn't feed it and I tormented it and I swung it round by its ears and chucked it against walls, you know, what sort of animal are you going to produce? You're going to produce a monster. Yeah. Yet yeah, they do it to kids, you know. I was on the baby P case and what, what the mother and her boyfriend was doing to that poor kid. Yeah, that was... You know, they were doing similar stuff, you know. The, the fellow would hold the kid up by its ears and they would time him, see how long he could do it for a survival thing, for a tough thing, by the kid's ears. By the kid had a broken back through beatings and, and they'd set the dog on him and things like that and, and, and laugh while the dog was fighting this little tiny kid. You know, what, what would have happened to that kid? If he'd have survived, what sort of individual would he have been? Never looked at it like that. And when you look at these programs, a lot of people are into serial killers now. You know, there's a, there's a brilliant um, Netflix one um, about how they, the FBI's inception in serial killer um, investigations or whatever. I've, I can't remember what it's called. It'll come to me in a minute. Phenomenal. And they, they actually profile them, but they do it by talking to them. And, you know, you've got bl blokes like Kemba, um, a man of absolute hatred, again, for women, because he was tortured by his mother. And and you look back at these people, that they come from torture, vicious torture, and a lot of it with the mother, and that produces this, like I said earlier, this viciousness that you don't get anywhere else. So when you're dealing with sex offenders, you, emotionally, they stopped when they were hurt, and that's your way in. Intellectually, they'll defeat you because they're devious and cunning and clever. Yeah. And they will, and you never tell them too much about yourself, because once you do, that's their lever in. That they'll they'll start picking you apart, profiling you on a level that you can't, and then they'll weaken you. But you've got to work out where their way in is, and it's always in childhood. So you start off talking about their childhood and their relationship with their mother. When were they taken away from their mother? At what age? What was the relationship like? I always wondered why, because whenever you see anything, so tell me your relationship with your family. And always. Tell me, tell me, you know, what your childhood was like. And I never understood yeah. that until now. So, yeah. one, I appreciate you opening my mind to that. Um, but and, it makes sense. And, and this is a, so if we go back to this little girl, and then was Zoe started telling me and about other girls. So she gave me another girl, and I spoke that girl, gave me another girl. And we, we, in the end, we had this whole like, harem of young girls that were working actively as prostitutes. The youngest was nine years old. And they were wow. traded in crack houses. They were traded for rocks of crack. And then they were traded in upmarket Mayfair restaurants. There was um, a judge that was involved in it. There was a police officer rumoured, you know, and then more things were coming out. And what happened was... So within, I don't know, within two years of being warned for the first time, I'm dragged in again. And I'm told, drop it, drop it, drop it. Uh, by a senior officer, a guy who's, who's still a serving, high-ranking, one of the most high-ranked senior officers in this country. Shame on this man, shame on this man. And he's still, still serving? Still serving the, to this day. And he turned around to In say, the police force, yeah, not yeah, in prison? Yeah, yeah, no, in the police force. Um, and he turned around to me and said, if you don't stop what you're doing, you're going to lose your home, you can lose your job, you can lose your children. You need to back down now, right? Um, it scared the life out of me because I knew these threats had come before. Uh, the little girl, the main witness, was found dead shortly after this. Um, again, definitely, you know, unascertained. It was um, she was injected with some drug that she'd never used before, some opiate. Uh, found dead on the street, and. Um, I continued to speak out on it, and then over a four-year period, there was there was nine attempts to imprison me. Um, the police actually stopped paying me, so I went for nearly three years without an income. 
Um, and then the ultimate thing come was they tried to take one of my kids into care. Um, and at a point in my life where it, I said, talk in its own right, but one of my kids was on life support. And while I was sitting by his side as he was dying, um, they were trying to get my other kid into care who was at home with my older boy. Uh, all to shut me up, all to shut me up. So that's the whistleblower thing. You know, in one week we found 50 children, 50 children that were actively being pimped out, that were in the care system, that were known about. The police knew about them. You know, the missing person team knew about them. The social workers all knew what was happening, yet they did nothing. Um, and there was not one appointed officer to deal with it. So when you get, like, commissioner of police, like Crested Dick, saying we're doing this, we're doing that, for seven years, after I made that allegation, the, the, Bernard Hogan Howe, and then I think it went on to Crested Dick, never ever appointed one dedicated officer for seven years to look into the problem that is child prostitution, which myself and uh, this other girl had highlighted. Um, so I, that was it. I was out of the police. I, was, oh, I, I managed to get my pension um, because I wouldn't shut up. I was too much of a problem for them. And there was nine cases that they tried to put before a Crown Court all on nonsense, um, but then all of them were dropped, but then so another woman got in touch with me and she was a police officer in Manchester. And they went on to make a documentary about this woman called Three Girls. Um, and she, she said, John, I need to talk to you. What, what happened to you happened to me? The same things. And I said, do you what? She went, yeah, yeah. She said, I was working in Rochdale um, and all these girls, exactly the same thing. And I was threatened. And they tried to do the same, put cases to court to try and prosecute me. Why is it that they they put a task force together to capture them when they know at, at some point they're going to have to try and shut it down? Because if you're good at your job, which it sounds like you was the best in your field, it was inevitable that you was going to find the root of... And, and, and the other thing is once it gets out, it don't go back in the box because nah. it's too big. So what happened was another cop had come forward who, who'd exposed the kids' home in Jersey where they were actually torturing the kids to so sex games and killing them. Same thing happened to him. And they couldn't discredit us. So they can discredit the junkie, the victim of sexual yeah. abuse. They can discredit them. They couldn't discredit us. So they had to try and imprison us and then get dirt on us to say this is, you know, and, and they tried with every single what one of us. What things did they try and put you in prison for? Right. Uh, the main one is data protection violation. Mm -hmm. So what they'll do is they'll go through all your records when you've looked at criminal intelligence and said you shouldn't have looked at that because that's, a, and again, it's a criminal offence which could go to Crown Court. One of them, get this, um, uh, it was happening on almost a monthly basis. I was being dragged in and I refused to be interviewed. I said, I, I laughed. I said, get, get effed. I ain't, no way, I'm not playing your game. Mm -hmm. I said, if you want me, you charge me. So what I did was I, I wrote a letter to Cresta Dick and I gave her permission to search my house anytime she wanted. And I said, I'll even give you a key. My back door's broken, it doesn't work. So you can come in. It does work now, but back then it didn't work. <laughs> Say that yeah, on yeah, camera. Yeah, you know. <laughs> and I got a dog. <laughs> yeah, I said, I said, anytime, here's my number. You, you've got, you have got open season to search me. I will surrender my phone my laptop, any recording device, you search my house. I told him, come and get me. And I said, whatever offence you say I've done, I'm saying now I'm guilty, but take me to Crown Court, right? Take me to Crown Court. I will have my day in front of my peers, in front of the UK. And, and I said, this is what I'm going to say. And, I, and I, I wrote a 23-page statement of everything I knew. I gave a copy to, to the national press. Uh, they certainly tried to do me for that as well giving information to the national press, <coughs> which went nowhere. Um, I gave it to, to an MP. So I gave it to an MP. This MP was brave enough to stand in Parliament, and he was the policing minister. They've all got their own jobs, the cabinet ministers anyway. He's a privy councillor, so he, he, he's a front bencher, um, and he's a policing minister for crime, for policing and crime. So he's in charge of basically one down from the Home Secretary. Governing the govern. Yeah, yeah, so he's in charge. All the police commissioners answer to this minister. So he then gets my statement. He's like, my God. So he stands up in, in Parliament and he says, look, I've got this statement from this police officer. Next day, Theresa May. Again, Theresa May, whatever she says, this woman is, is a liar and a snake. 
turned around and removed him from his post and said, stay away from John Wedger the next day. He was removed from his post as policing and crime minister the next day for speaking out on my behalf in Parliament. Um, so I, I get called in by the police again and they say, uh, right, you're, um, and I'm working at this point as, as a labourer and a block layer for two, two um, landscape gardeners, you know, stroke builders. And I'm getting 80 quid a day labouring for a 10 hour day. Do you know what I mean? And I've worked in the office as the old bill most of my life. So I'm strong enough and I'm capable enough to do it, but you'll do what you have to do. You know, yeah, these, yeah. Lads, these lads were good. I, God bless them. But again, they had to, they had to sack me in the end because of the national press. One of them was going, John, because I ended up in the national press and he's reading the paper one day and I'm on it. And he went, John, how can I have you as my labourer? Look, they, yeah. they'll come after me and I'll get done for like paying you cash in hand and doing this and doing that. Yeah. And, you know, so I lost that lovely little number. Lovely number. It was hard work. There's nothing, you know, uh, but they were good lads. Uh, and uh, so I get called in the police. And they said, right, you're, you're under arrest for attempting to supply heroin, class A drugs. Wow. And I, I laughed and they went, we've got evidence here that will get you 15 years. So I turned around to this bloke and said, so you've got evidence that's going to get me 15 years without a Crown Court hearing. You're confident you'll get me 15 years. He went, yeah. I said, well, get fucked then. Don't, don't, don't come near me then. Then deal with it. Just see you in court. And, and he went, you've got to have this form. I said, I ain't going to have nothing. You're now telling me I'm, I'm Nick for supplying Class A drugs. Seriously? And I laughed. And I just, and I did. I laughed in his face. I went, you, you know, I don't want to swear on your, your, your channel. And, um, and how it turns out, so this is what they do. This is what the commissioner of the police will do to one of their own who's investigating child abuse, right? This is what they do. And this was all sanctioned by Cressida Dick, by the way, right? Um, there was, they went through 15 years of my emails. So I, what I did was I made an allegation of corruption, right? For this senior officer and two other senior officers deliberately covering up child prostitution. So they said, right, so I'm now a vulnerable, intimidated and key witness in a major crime investigation, right, in which a, a, a kid died, you know. So you'd think that they would have an interest in me and look after me. Instead of investigating the crime, they passed it on to three different forces. So it got passed on to, um, to a national thing, then it ended up with a national crime agency. They kept passing this my, my allegations on so no one could deal with it. Yeah. And each time it would get lost and then it get found again, then it get lost. It was luckily, I think the Daily Express and Daily Mail, they followed the audit trail with it. And so it had to remain in public domain, otherwise it, it would have gone, right? Um, so they went through all, so they then attacked me. So they spent four years, instead of investigating the, the serious crime allegations I made, which were in a public interest of a police force deliberately covering up child prostitution in which nine-year-olds and upwards were being pimped out to all manner of society, right? They decided to then come for me. So I got warned by um, uh, a former detective from Greater Manchester Police who'd spoke out. She said, they'll have you for data protection violation. So they'll go through all your criminal intelligence searches. So this other copper from Jersey, he said the same. He said, that that's exactly what they did to me. And they'll find anything, absolutely anything. So I had numerous of these cases. Each one was its own file, ready to go to Crown Court. And then they went, found an email, and I worked with, with a guy that was, I did undercover, covert stuff for a little while. And I worked with a guy who was um, an infiltrator, a covert, um, long-term infiltrator. And them guys all go nuts. They, they all lose their identity. They go skewy, you know, because it's high pressure and they've got these different identities and they, they lose a the plot. They do. It, it's just one of them things. And that's why it's quite short-lived, that, that life. Anyway, he'd lost a plot and he'd done a runner and gone to France. He was a brilliant, brilliant copy. He wrote a book. Um, anyway, so he gets in touch with me because he knew that my surname was unique, so there was only one John Wedger. So yeah. he lost all contact, but he knew if he put in John Wedger at metpolice.co.uk, they're going to get my account. Mm -hmm. So he sends me this email, and his legend, his alter ego was, he would live as a tramp. 
right? And he used to say to me, he said, um, the easiest people to infiltrate were like these uh, sort of new ages, you know? And he said, all you've got to do with them is roll a joint and have long hair and roll a joint. Instantly, they, they're like, there's no way he's a copper. He's got long, he's got ponytail and he smoked a joint. Yeah. And he said, they are such mugs. And yeah, like, police can't do drugs. Well, they can't, you know, but... Yeah. So you mustn't be a copper. Yeah. You know, and stuff like that, you know. So, oh, look, smoked a joint. And, and he said they were so easy to, to infiltrate. And he said the other ones were... Um, uh, you know, like the street scene, the street dealing and the shoplifting and all that. He said, because he used to have a Jack Russell dog and he was covered in tattoos and uh, and he could speak foreign languages. So he, he would have tattoos and have a little Jack Russell. And he said it was, it was the best thing he ever did was have this little dog. And he used to sleep on the streets and you bump into him every now and then and you get a little wink. And uh, so I said, are you still living as a tramp? And he said, yeah. And I said, I said, well, let's meet up. You bring the tenant super and I'll bring the methadone. We'll have a cocktail and a chat. And that was it, right? That was, if you read this series of three emails, you realise the con context of it. And the Metropolitan Police, in their infinite wisdom and, and their brilliant powers of deduction, deduced from that that I was supplying Class A drugs and they had enough to prosecute me as a dealer of Class A drugs. Wow, just from just Just from that, that just from that. And this is what, what, what tossers they are, you know. Um, and again, I never knock the Bobby on the beat, the plod, but I do knock these professional standards units that are used uh, as a mechanism to cover up serious criminality, which we've seen with Jimmy Savile, which we will definitely see with Prince Andrew, you know, which we will see with all these, these specialist little, they're not specialist units, these are people that have sold their soul um, and they do nothing but perpetuate awful, horrific criminality that, that allows child abuse to continue. So shame on them, and these commissioners know it. Um, so the, the, that was an example of what they did um, to, to try, and, and then they tried to do me for child abandonment. So my son was on a life support machine. He was going to turn the machine off, was going to be turned off on the fifth day, on the third day of my son being dead, basically. He actually managed to wake up. I went home exhausted and the police there arrested me for child abandonment because I left my 15-year-old boy home alone with my 26-year-old boy. Again, met police, under Crested Dick, there, and then denied everything. You know, when, of course, the press got hold of me mm -hmm. and I started putting the word out there and I started speaking out in government inquiries. Um, they're all backpedal, they're cowards and they're liars, you know. Um, so I was, I was well rid of the police by that time. There was nothing more they could do with me. I'd had enough of it. Um, and I just thought, this is wrong, but I've got these skills. And I then um, was in touch with an ex-criminal um, called Bill Maloney. And he had um, a film company called Pine Mash Films. And he's one of the loveliest blokes I've met in my life. What a character, a South East London boy from the street. Peckham boy, tough little lad, um, was abused in the care system, went on into, into organised criminality and then turned his life around and then decided to campaign for all victims and survivors of abuse. So me and him sort of gelled and a real character, you know. So I started doing a lot of campaigning with him and from, from that I started doing my own podcasting and I would go out and start interviewing victims and survivors of abuse. Yeah. So I'd, think, I'd take, take a microphone, take a mobile phone, um, uh, an ex-BBC journalist trained me on how to, to podcast and use my phone as a broadcasting medium. And I think the first one I went out got 2.2 million hits. Wow. Bang. Thinking, flipping hell. It's unbelievable. And then I started, if I was to do a live, I could have 7,000 live viewers. Whereas if you've got 200, that's going to give you 10,000 return. Yeah. I was getting these phenomenal. So I started setting up my own channel. And it was ludicrous. I was, I was non-stop. I was going everywhere. And I, I was getting victims and survivors um, that had come from care homes mainly in the 60s or 70s and that. And so I'd put their testimonies out. But then I started getting victims and survivors of ritualistic abuse. 
satanic ritualistic abuse. Yeah, I've heard about this. And that was a game changer. That was when um, I, 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 you really understand what conspiracy is. That is a level of nastiness, deviance, and organisation that I was ill-prepared for. It's, oh, really? Oh, my word. Even though you've gone through all this stuff so yeah, far, yeah, and witnessed yeah. all of that, this yeah. is the and, worst. And they, so Satanists started, organised Satanists started then deplatforming me. So what they would do is they'd go to any broadcasting standards and they'd, they'd, what they were doing was transcribing everything I'd ever said and going through it like with a fine-tooth comb. That's a data protection standard. And they would spend hours and days and months and then submit these files to the standards people. They would contact the Home Secretary if I said anything about an ongoing case. So I'd then have letters coming through from, from the Home Office that you've now breached um, uh, um, contempt issues regarding a Crown Court trial. And then I'd have papers served on me for that. Um, if I set up funding, they'd contact the GoFundMe or just give him whatever and try and get everything revoked saying that I was gaining money for unlawful purposes. And this is what they did, because I was one of the only people speaking out against satanic ritual abuse, which is very, very real. Is this this one where they drink the blood of a young child and stuff for immortality? But yeah, and yeah stuff? It, it's, it's all sorts. It's, right, it's ancient deity, wor deity worship. This predates Christianity. We're going back to the Canaanites, the days of Baal, you know, when they worshipped these deities and they would do sacrifices. So you, you saw it in the Jewish faith where they'd sacrifice their firstborn, you know, Abraham was doing it and and you had this and they continue doing it and they worship uh the devil, they worship Lucifer, they worship these these nine legions of demons, Baal, Paimon, um, Leviathan, they've all got these names. And it's ancient and it's been going on for a long, long time. But it what it is, it's the, the, the more modern stuff is an attack on Christianity. It's not an attack on Islam. It's not an attack on Buddha. It's not an attack on Hinduism. It's an attack on Christianity. So a lot of what they do is the antithesis, the antithesis of, of Christianity. So And they will do things so the, the victim and survivor will never, ever go to God, to Jesus, you know? Um, so I've just had one woman um, we've been talking with, and what they would do is they would, be, they would rape. It's all about rape you know, blood sacrifices, because blood has power. Um, people will pay for for rituals because they want something, right? I've heard of a world champion boxer who went, went to God in the end. Uh, again, I'm not going to say his name, but he went to have a voodoo ceremony so he could become world champion. No I heard of a, a, a premiership um, African footballer who, who paid for the mutilation of a child um, so he could become a premier, you know, you know, businessman as well, doing it. So you'll have um, worship, right? It's all for privilege, power and perversion, right? So they'll be worshipped to these deities because they want to get somewhere in life, right? But it depends on what they want. And if they want something, then there's got to be blood. There has to be a sacrifice. Now, that could be a chicken. Right? We see this in the voodoo stuff. Um, or it could be a dog. So you will find mutilated animals at these ritual sites. But is, is the purity in the animal as it is in the child? The child is better. So if you've got a child and then you, you want a frightened child because of the, the, the blood will be drank and it will be enhanced with the adrenaline that's in the blood. Um, uh, boys are preferred over girls. Why is that? I don't know. I don't know. Is it because they're, they're capturing the masculine soul of the child? or what, what, Whatever it is. It, see, their job also is twofold. So the Satanist job is to, is to make money, right? So there's money at the end of it. So they'll pay for rituals, huge amounts of money, especially if a child has to be abducted or procured from somewhere. So again, they'll prey on the, co the lowest common denominator. Um, and these kids do go missing. And aren't found, and if they are found, they're mutilated sometimes. Um, uh, so there's money involved, but also the job is to give the demon a home. Now, this goes back pre the flood when they said that the, the lands were inhabited by giants. The flood came and it disembodied these spirits. Yeah, so the a spirit is a disembodied human being, it hasn't got a home, so it needs a home. 
in many ways you can give a demon a home, you know, by by bad actions, bad bad lies, bad manners, bad this, bad that, through crime, through violence, through perversion. Sex is one of the quickest way you can give a demon a home. So their job also, the Satanists, is to impart a demon into into a child or into someone else, and they'll do that through sex rituals, through rape. So children are used. I've spoken to um, one woman who told me that uh, when she was six years old, uh, she's a, a family long-term Satanist, intergenerational Satanist, and she said she was taken to a well-known film studio. Again, I can't say. And they, they sellotaped like a, a um, letter opener to her hand. She was in a white dress. And on the altar was five babies. And her job was to plunge the letter opener into the, the, the vagina of the baby and stab it to death. I've heard of another woman who was bit the, the, the beating heart of a boy that had been abducted in, uh, in Ireland. Um, and she was made to bite and, and, and bite into the heart. And then afterwards was covered in the blood and then she was raped and then there was an orgy. And this, I've heard this time and time again, it's very, very similar things. I've, I've had mainly women, there have been some men, but mainly women who have, have told me to my face that they have killed babies. I know one woman, she said uh, five babies, she's, they've impregnated her in her teen years and the aborted babies, or the living babies, were then sacrificed. She was a breeder, five of them. You know, and there, there's corroboration in their medical records, you know, um, and yet nothing is ever, ever done. Um, but the one difference that you get with victims and survivors of sexual abuse and victims and survivors of satanic ritual abuse, and this covers things like opia, big in the Jamaican community, Opia is is Satanism, well, it's voodoo that was uh, just bastardised in the, the colonial islands. So you'll get the, the, the Southern Caribbean and, and uh, you know, the Central American, you'll get things called Santeria, big in Cuba, very big in Cuba. Again, it's voodoo. When the slaves are taken from Benin and Ghana and Sierra Leone, you know, and they were shipped over to the New World. Uh, they took with them their, their, their ancient belief system, which, again, they worship these demons, which are the same demons as I mentioned earlier. Mm. So you will see a demon called Leviathan, which is, is mentioned in the Bible, and it, it, it's, it's, you can research it. It's, it's, it's a serpent demon. Uh, its medium is water. The, the industry that utilise it most is the cosmetic and the music industry because it's about vanity. Um, the Africans call it the mammy water. The, in Opio, it's called something to do with water as well. And they're, they're, it's the same demon. And there'll be other demons like Baal, uh, would to do with business, power. So this will be the demon that covers court cases and it will cover... Um, uh, financial deals. So when a sacrifice is made, it be made to that demon to collapse a court case to do this. And it, and you will find this exactly the same process of, of appeasing these demons in 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 the West African cultures, in the Jamaican cultures, in in the the British cultures uh, was with, with this. In the Romanians have got their own version of of of, of deity worship and witchcraft very powerful, well, they're all powerful, you know, yeah. not to be underestimated. Um, the gypsies have got one, you know, and it's, they're, they're everywhere. And even if you go to Northern Europe, you will find it as well. And it's ancient, and, and you've only got to watch the Hammer House of Horror films. There's quite a few. There was a film with, with um, is it Wesley Snipes in it? I can't remember the name of it. It's called The Fallen. And again, it goes on about the worship of, of um, Paimon, the demon Paimon. And it's, it's, it shows how this worship is used and passed on. And, 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 and it's quite, I think it's called The Fallen. There's another one called, is, is it that, Hideous? Yeah, it's Hideous. Yeah, it's hideous. Hideous, hideous or something like that, again, which shows the same worship of that God. There's, so there's loads of stuff out there that, that shows on it. But the main difference, going back to this, Paul, is this. There's a thing called DID, and it's called Disassociated Identity Disorder multiple personalities so people that have been 
satanically ritually abused will have multiple personalities and they could have hundreds of them. So not only will they be raped as a child, they will be electrocuted, right? So they, 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 they get great delight in pain and torment. So they will torture them. They will electrocute a child. Drowning is a massive one. They, a lot of them all remember being drowned, waterboarded or drowned. Why is um, the whole water... Again, the Leviathan, it's appeasing these. But it, a lot of the, 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 the Satanists um, are very apt in, um, in resuscitation. So there was, um, it came out in the court case of the infamous paedophile, Sidney Cook, and his thing would be to re he knew how to resuscitate kids. So if if you make a sacrifice, if you make a sacrifice of one child <clears throat> to its death, and then you resuscitate the child, is that then on the, on the block again to go through it again? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's the, the children have got two values here, right? So an intergenerational child born into Satanism will be kept alive. Their life will be tormented and, and traumatised till the day they die. And especially with this multiple personality, right? But the other one is abducted children or children that have been taken from the care system. They're going to die. They'll be taken, procured for a ritual because there will be a client that will pay for it. You know, there is a structure. I give a talk on the structure, the hierarchy of Satanism, the different levels and these different peoples. So you'll get low level people procure. They will know the kids in an area. They will know dysfunctional families. Always poverty. Dysfunctional families will always be preyed on, right? They will always do it. They will know if a kid's subject to care orders because they will have someone in that system, right? Um, so if a client wants a certain kid and they can't procure one from their community, they will know they can go and get this kid. Wow. Um, I mean, it came out at Elm Guest House. You know, there was... There was um, Testimonies from people there that kids that they were kept as lookout when when children were abducted and taken off. Um, I, you know, and again, what happens is that the child is done for payment. I, I know of um, two. Again, I've got to be very careful what I say because it's usually a backlash, but this is the truth. Two organised criminals. I don't think we have to sort of dig too deep to think who they might have been. And they would procure children for parties. That was how they became very, very wealthy, because they were procuring children for parties. And sometimes these children weren't, weren't returned. And they went on to have a very infamous career criminal, you know, uh, lifestyle. So organised crime is involved in this. Um, there are politicians involved in this. Uh, whenever anyone speaks out, you get a thing called D notices start getting served on 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 members of the press. The D notice is a defence notice, so it's a military intelligence weapon. And uh, many journalists have started really looking into the, the real crops of organised paedophilia. I've had D notices served on them. And that, let's not forget that the head of MI6 was Sir Peter Heyman, who was a convicted paedophile. Head of MI6, Sir Peter Heyman. You know, we've had home secretaries that have been involved. We, but we, even our own prime minister, our own prime minister, Mr. Ted Heath, was outed in the disclosure as, as being the sexual abuser and rapist of dozens of children and an active Satanist. An active Satanist. And this was um, this is all out in the open. This came out in Operation Conifer. Uh, there was a, a very very brave guy called Mike Veal, the Chief Constable of Wiltshire made that disclosure on Sky News and they destroyed his career as well. Yeah, oh, that, Mike Veal. that would, um, wouldn't go down well for his... No, no. So this is a level of, of deep. Now, what happens with a child when they are subjected to such horrors? Their mind frag fragments, right? It breaks. So a personality will develop to deal with electricity. So if you've been satanically ritually abused as a kid and you've got multiple personality if i jabbed you now with with a live electric cable this personality would kick in and you'd give it a childish name like sparky right or if you was drowning this personality would kick in and you'd survive but you would you would disassociate from you and you would become this there, there, there's a a book called 
um, Am I a Good Girl Now? And it's written by a lady called Carolyn Bramhall, and it's a powerful read. And she's a therapist, but a survivor of satanic ritual abuse herself. This woman is no bigger than this bottle. Honestly, she's the smallest woman on the planet. And um, she had 192 personalities. And she said, wow. one, one of them was called Panda. And she said, Panda knocked out a six foot man and didn't just knock him out, knocked him over a table and he, he said, went through a wall. I went, but Panda's you, right? She went, yeah. I said, but why Panda? She said, whenever I was being tortured, brutalized, Panda would come. And Panda, because he wore white and black, like a doorman. And Panda is seven foot tall and he's huge. And he can fight with both his fists, right? She said he's good with his left and he's good with his right. So when some man attacked her, Panda took over and she smashed his bloke up, right? She went for an eye test because she wears these massive milk bottom glasses, like that huge, great big thick glasses. And she said Panda would always see if I was in trouble. So Panda had perfect eyesight. She gets triggered on the way to Specsavers and Panda takes over. So she goes to an eye test, 20-20 vision. And when she signs, she signs with her left hand because he's ambidextrous, Panda. Oh. But she's right-handed. So she couldn't get a prescription for her glasses <laughs> because she said, hang on, you passed the eye test. But it weren't her, it was her altar. You know, and it's a very complex... Have you seen that film Split? Yeah. That is DID. That is 100% DID. And that is always satanic ritual abuse. And that is why, because the trauma is so great. Boom, boom, boom. I know one girl, she's got about 100 personalities. And she said they bark at her all the time. And they, and the job to do is to amalgamate them because they're there to protect the child. But now they're an adult, so they have to sit in front of a mirror and bring each personality in. But sometimes there's a personality that is loyal to the Satanists. And that's more difficult to get rid of. That's a different way of getting rid of it. Um, and then, but what do we call them? Nutters, schizos, you know, but they ain't. You know, they are people that are living with extreme trauma. And we're interacting day in, day out with these people. And our mental health system fails them because it doesn't understand them. If anyone gets near to them, the authors tell them to self-destruct and to kill themselves. Die, die, kill yourself, kill yourself, kill yourself. And they'll all be shouting, shouting at them all at once. Hundreds of voices shouting, die, 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 kill yourself. So then you'll get people commit suicide, you know. And what they need is the right therapy. Um, and on top of that, they've been sexually abused, you know. I, I know of women who've, whose bodies have got clear signs of multiple births, yet don't remember even having a child. And there was scarring in their uterus, there's clear signs. Because they shut it out. Yeah, yeah, totally shut out. They don't remember anything. You know, they'll have anal, deep anal scarring, which is conducive with, with, with rape. You know, one woman had, she had stab wounds inside her uterus where they would put sacrificial swords and stab her and she don't remember it. It comes out every now and then that they'll get flashbacks in a dream, usually in the morning. These, these flashbacks come back to them um, and they can't, they don't know how to deal with them. So they could just be interacting normally. They could be married and, and all of a sudden their life comes back and they don't know what to do. Um, at some it's scary, point. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's real. It is real. It's documented. There has been dozens of cases in the British criminal system um, that, that have alluded to, to people being raped, tortured and murdered under deity worship, satanic ritual abuse or voodoo or whatever. We saw the case of the body in the Thames, the body of Adam, the little boy that was found. That is a mooty killing. That is without a doubt um, a voodoo related um worship of, of leviathan um it's quite clear do the police know about it they've been told they ignore it they don't deal with it seriously they don't deal with the ritualistic stuff seriously you know there are there are forces do they not deal with it because they're a part of it or some um, some of the higher uh, power ones might uh, be a part of it 100 percent um at, at dark echelons that they, they will have their own people in the police um, I, I've been a victim of police cover-ups and I know of other officers that have good, upstanding, decent, morally driven human beings and we've been threatened and we've been covered up and 
these chief constables, yes, they're aware. Are they Satanists? I don't know. I can't prove it. Um, is it evil to cover this? It's up 100%. Is it the work of the devil to cover up this? Is, in my opinion, yes, it is. You know, So you can only draw an inference. Don't just look at those that do it. Look at those that fail to address it or be part of the machinations to cover it up. Look at where these maggots come from. Whenever I would do a podcast on ritual abuse, um, I would get articles in Private Eye magazine knocking me, attacking me. There's been three articles in Private Eye magazine. Yet the bloke who does it, Ian Hislop, he's always on the telly and all this. Why, why does he have his journalists attack me? Yeah. There's one called Rosie Waterhouse, one of his journalists, always attacks anyone who speaks out against satanic ritual abuse in that magazine. Yet he's on the telly, turning around, making out what a good human being he is, and and how he he will he will deal with the contentious issues that other press don't. Yet he, his magazine is the first one to attack anyone who speaks out. Um, I actually know one survivor of abuse, and his magazine attacked him, so he went round there and went into their offices and, and said to him, "You you ever put anything about me and my family again? So I'll break your jaw." And he, and he said he turned around and he said that his son was. Absolutely shaking in his boots, he said. He said, "I took the fight straight to him." He said, and he was sitting there almost in tears. Yeah, you know. And he said, "That's how I dealt with him." And he never put another thing out about me or him. So again, look at those that attack it. You know, we got to be careful because um, not everything is connected to that. But I mean, let's just look at this concert that we've had recently with Travis Scott, in which um, eleven people died. You know, yeah. like people, I mean, from ch children up. Wasn't yeah, it? I mean. That, that has just got dark satanic connotations right the way through it. Really? Oh, 100%. 100%. In, in what way? You break it down, the, the the portals in the background, there's attack on Christianity, crosses the wrong way, uh, it, it, very, very dark, very sort of demonic in, in the symbolism, in his behaviour. Who was the other one? Little Vaz or whatever his name is who did the trainers with blood in them? Oh yeah, yeah. Have you seen that video uh, where he's actually riding the devil? He's no, I haven't, but I have seen the trainers. Yeah, because um, Nike put in a lawsuit against them, didn't well, they? Yeah, um, and then watch the video. Watch the video. It is purely satanic from start to finish. It is just unbelievable. It's all symbolism. When when we used to raid paedophiles' homes, we had indicators that we look for and subtle indicators. You see them everywhere once you know. So one of them would be a picture called the crying boy. And it would be like a picture of a boy's face. He's got a little tear. He's sort of very sudden like that. Another picture would be quite, it's quite an infamous picture back in like the eighties, nineties. And there'd be a fireplace and there'd be two little naked kids facing it. And you all saw their little bare bums. Again, an indicator for other paedophiles that we, pro we provide little kids. So we found it with the boats, with, like I said, the Action Man and the Barbie doll, the Rose in Gym, in the windows. And it's an indicator, boys and girls, boys and girls. Um, monkeys would be used a lot um, because it's dehumanisation and it shows that, that there would degrade children in here. So these symbols are everywhere. You, you get it a lot if anyone um, has anything to do with intelligence services or, or secret societies. Whenever you watch these protection officers, especially the, the um, police protection officers and military protection officers, look at their lapel badges. Look at them, and you'll see these little like charity badges. And people go, oh, it's just a charity badge. It's not. It's not. They're indicators of what they're connected with. Really? Yeah, there's one um, you'll see a lot with Special Branch, and it'll be Rupert the Bear. Little Rupert the Bear. You know Rupert the Bear? Yeah. And you think, oh, Rupert the Bear badge, that's nice. But you look carefully, Rupert the Bear's left trouser legs rolled up, showing it's a Masonic connection. And it's everything is in the subtle. Signs and symbols. And you used to get it with shops, they would always advertise through signs and symbols. Like the special handshake, but oh, through roaches. Uh, uh, yeah, through badges. And you'll see and there's all these different types of badges, different or a little flower, different colour. It'll all donate something. It all means something. Very, very discreet. And if you're in the know, you're in the know. There's wheels within wheels within wheels within wheels all the time. And you'll see it. And they'll say certain things will be said, um, you know, especially when it comes to secret societies, certain words are used, you know. I mean, with masonry, you know, it, uh, a lot of masons 
It's instead of saying hello, how are you? Greetings, greetings. I greet you well, greetings. And it's a Masonic way of addressing people. So if they, they, you know, you go from meeting someone and said, "Oh, greetings," you know straight away. Yeah. And if if you respond back, then you know each other. Again, anyone else would say, "Well, that's just being nice." No, it's not. You're showing you who you are and what 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 level you're at and what this and what that. And it's all these little co words and they're, they're there all the time, always in society, hidden away. But that that was where um, where where life took me um, into that world. And my word, it was you know when you have to protect yourself, you know, because these people hate you, they hate what you do, and they will use their influence and their position and their prayer because they'll spend a long time praying against you because they hate you. Um, Do you reckon they would have put you in there if they'd have known how good you was going to be? Well, I, I think the biggest mistake that the, the, the police did with me was attacking me for doing good work. You know, why would you do that? Mm. I was doing something, and it, I've been proven to do good. I've just last year um, what was was asked by the government inquiry to give evidence. I provided a 50-page statement um, at an open government inquiry into cover-ups. And I was one of the national key witnesses um, so I attained quite high status and the government actually did listen to me for the first time, which was massive and it overrode all the police and everything else. It overrode them all. And I was part of, of, of a huge inquiry with victim survivors, you know, members of the intelligence services gave evidence. Um, that there was people high up in parliament, people high up in the social services, all giving evidence and others made to, to be accountable for the failings. And um, mind blowing. but they try to destroy my statement, you know, uh, they, they, the government got hold of it and decimated it and, and to, to a point where it didn't make any sense. And then they put the pages back in different orders. So if it read, it didn't make any sense. They did it on purpose. But luckily, I had a fantastic barrister who fought it and got it all put back in chronology, you know, and, and it made sense. But if it was left to the government, it would have just come up as, as out of context and out of chronology and half written sentences which didn't piece together. And this is the little tricks they pay because they don't want it getting out because it's got power, because it has got blackmail value. And when you've got politicians involved and people in business, you can coerce them and manipulate them. Yeah, I was um, I was so shocked, like, um, as, as you know, Netflix does do a few things on people within the power and the limelight yep. um, of paedophilia on, I mean, one very well-known person. I don't know whether I'd be allowed to say his name, but I know Netflix done it. And he's dead. Yeah, he's, he's, he died. He, he hung himself in, um, in, in thing, but he was attached to everybody. He was attached to politicians, the royal family, like, and, and everything in this. So it was... Um, they're, they're a fair game. I mean, we saw with Jimmy Savile my words i mean you, you know you've only got to look back at some of his old stuff especially when he does that interview with louis Ferru. yeah and he's threatening people all through that yeah he is threatening them and he's just saying how people stand under him you know uh you know that man was a well connected and that was reported to surrey police many numerous occasions really yeah what was done nothing nothing Cover up, what, cover why up. do you think it because he was so well connected with people yeah yeah he was a procurer of children because all oh right okay right, so, 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 so when, when, when when you've got he's a satanist as well there was um a picture of him in the full regalia got out you know um and, and you've got these levels this hierarchy this pyramid of power and you've got people that watch and they'll watch society they'll watch who's who so they're intelligence scouts you know they'll use heroin addicts they'll use other perverts they'll use active satanists and all that and then they'll report back you know, to people that can then put it together. And then it goes to what they call fixers. And the fixers, they're the ones that will get the kids presented at a place at a time when needed. And of course, what was it? Jim will fix it. He was a fixer. He could fix it to have kids provided wherever, whenever. And the man was an active Satanist uh, to boot. So, you know, th there were kids that were abused. How many maybe didn't? get that far were lucky enough to go home you know yeah do you know what i mean and um the, the man was pure evil pure evil and he got away with it because he knew who else was involved who didn't stop in and deal with that how comes that man never got a bullet in his head you know how comes a survivor never got near him and because he was protected 
It was my, and there was security teams to make sure no one got near him. But who would have it? Who would have that on their conscience that they were a security team for Jimmy Savile? Oh, you know, makes you wonder, doesn't it? Like yeah. what goes through their head also to be able to do that. You know, Paul, they, they, they can get away with it and laugh at us. They can attack people like me and the other brave police whistleblowers. They can do that. You know, they've got the power to do it. It's a war of attrition. And they've got the people and the power to see it through. We haven't. I haven't got the money to see it through. I've fought the government. I've fought the government three times now. And I've won on every occasion. I've won. But I wouldn't recommend it. And it nearly cost me my life. And it nearly cost me my children. And it nearly cost me everything. So bear in mind the threats that was made to me. You lose your home, your job, your children. Near enough, every single one come to fruition. Wow. Um, but they can't take my soul. My soul's intact and it belongs to Jesus Christ. And uh, that, that's my standpoint and that's the work I do now. I'm a, I'm a committed Christian. Uh, my job is to expose evil and, and to show the world that this goes on. And it has gone on for, for a long time with no conspiracy, pure fact. you know. Um, but I will go to my grave. And I'm telling you now, testimony now on your beautiful channel, I will go to my grave knowing I did everything I could in my power to stop children being abused. These others, they can't do that. They can't look in the mirror. They can't lay there. Every one of us, no one, none of us are getting off this planet alive. Mm. Some leave earlier than others, but one thing's for certain, we are all going to die. We ain't going to be able to take anything with us. No one ever went to their grave saying that they wish they had better trainers. They wish they had a bigger cock. They wish they had a bigger house. They wish they had more millions. Not one person ever, ever went to their grave declaring that. There's a brilliant book about palliative care. There was a nurse who spent 30 years with the dying. And she said, in 30 years, not once did anyone ever say, oh, I wish I'd worked hard, I wish I did. They all went with the same regrets. And there were regrets. Why did I work so hard? Why wasn't I a better person? Why didn't I spend more time with my family? Why, did, why didn't I be myself? You know, do this, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. All things like that. And we're all going to be, you know, people say to me, I don't believe in all this um, Jesus stuff and all this Satan stuff. I don't care. That, that's up to you, and it? it's your prerogative. You know, yeah. that's it. that's a personal choice. But I do, and I've seen evil. I've confronted evil. I've come up against it. I've encountered it, um, and it's real. It is real, and it is dangerous. I will say to anyone: do not mess with the occult. These these programs, when they go into these haunted houses and they provoke demons and they induce demons, they don't know what they're doing. They have no idea they're stupid. They're giving a stronghold, a foothold to evil. And that evil will get in them and it ain't leaving because they've legally given it right to do it. It's all about legal contracts. You know, and, and, and these tarot things, leave them alone. Do not mess with them. It's going to end in tears. And it will. It will end in tears. And at some point, someone's going to pick up the pieces. But these people that have abused... Um, these people that have covered up those that are abused, you know what? Shame on you. If you're listening, shame on you. Yeah. Because you're going to hell. And yeah. all those that have hurt children, damaged children, you know, you're going to hell. You really are. Whether you believe me or not, it doesn't matter. You know, you're getting it. Um, so and I hope hell is a horrible place. <laughs> I do, because if people are doing that and then they're, they're covering up such, such <laughs> catastrophic damage to to well, one the human race but to children deserve to be there oh yeah yeah you know i mean they're, they're the biggest gift we can get kids it sounds corny but they are and it's our job as adults to protect them and nurture them if i had my way the, the age of consent would be 21 mm. and and it would be in marriage It'd be a bit like some sort of Sharia law type thing. It would, honestly, I wouldn't. Is that because of the knowledge you know, or is that yeah, because yeah, of the yeah. religion? I would know because of the knowledge. Yeah. What I know. Uh, why? Why rush into these things? You know. Yeah, I mean, sex. Sex. When I was able, sex. When I was like legally able to sex that I would have from twenty one up is definitely different. Yeah. And in a loving relationship, yeah. you know. Because, you know, I think before that you're just having sex because everyone else is doing yeah. it and I don't think you fully understand why you're doing it, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think... I mean, if we look at it now, pornography, um, it's it's everywhere, right? I mean, I worked I mean, in Vice, you know. I've, I've spent hours watching porn for a living, you know. I've seen child porn. 
I've seen animal porn. I've seen the worst stuff, you know. I've seen some horrific things, you know. And, and of course, I've watched porn. I'm not going to turn around and say, I haven't done that. Of course, I've done it, you know. But it's wrong. Um, and kids, so now, years ago, you'd find a porno mag as a kid and everyone would have a look and, and there'd be dirty books on the shelf and there'd be dirty bookshops and that'd be it. But now they get their phones and you've got like a whole world of porn. It's like a superstore in porn. And and it's aggressive porn. It's gangbang porn, you know, you know, triple anal and stuff like that. You're seeing and these young girls are in there and, you know, and you're sitting there thinking, what is that doing? Mm. And then they're watching it and kids are watching it. And wh where is the, the filter? There is no filter. I am over 18, click. And that is it. Eight-year-old kids, that is their first experience of, 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 of sex is watching gangbangs and this. What's it going to do to your mind? It's, it's got, going to do nothing but twist and pervert. Years ago, there was a lady called Mary Whitehouse, and she was really ridiculed. She was like an adjudicator on, on television in, in respect to morals, and she was always screaming um, to, to the standard agencies and to Parliament about the perversion on the telly and spitting image and, and all these comedians, these sort of left-wing comedians back in the, the 80s in the day would, would knock this woman um, but she was right I what remember she, spitting image yeah you know that you look at what they did with Mary Whitehouse they absolutely demonized but what she, her message was was a good one she didn't like kids being perverted mm. you know and she was right she was right and if we look now the sexualization of children it's wrong and it's everywhere and we are seeing it all about and it needs it just needs to stop what are we doing what are we creating? And if we we have to stop, we stop it on all levels, you know? And we protect our children. And otherwise, it's them that gets hurt. And and they do get hurt because uh, a few, with what I do now with the podcast and that I've come across, is for a long time, the, the child that's now an adult blamed themselves for for them doing it. Like yeah. it was their, their fault why they done it to them. Um, is that because... The um, uh, abuser says to them, "Yeah, yeah, you get like, thing, drums that into them. You get a thing called cognitive dissonance and cognitive distortion. The two tools of, of a paedophile. Um, cognitive dissonance is a mental dissonance of a fact. Oh no, 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 it's not me. It's not me. I never did it. I never did it. Cognitive distortion is blaming a victim, putting it around that narcissistic, vile trend of you're you're in on this." You're part of it. You're as dirty as me. Look, we're both dirty together. And if I don't say anything, you can't say anything. And it, it brings in a conspiracy of silence, you know. And and they do it all the time, you know. Um, if I get into trouble, you will. Yeah, too, yeah. And, and they, they'll they'll do things like that. They'll rape a child and ejaculate inside the child and say, "There's a there's a demon inside you now." And if you say anything, it's going to grow because I'll put a seed in you. It's going to grow and grow and everyone will know and it, or it'll eat your stomach and it will burst out one day like in the alien film. They'll say yeah. that to, to the young mind and totally distort them or say, you know, I'll go to prison and, you know, if mummy finds out, then you'll go to a kid's home and you'll get beaten and you'll get this and you'll get more of it. So they'll do that. They'll use that guilt on a young mind. They're very deceptive individuals, you know, I mean, I was watching a thing the other day that came up on TikTok and it was Jimmy Savile and he had Rolf Harris on there. And I'm like, you know, thousands came forward even in the day. The BBC would have been told. The testimony of the testimony of people walking in, you know, shame on the BBC because when they first were given a chance to properly adjudicate and self-manage this, they said there's no case to answer. We've looked at the evidence, there is none. It was only when there was a government inquiry into it did the true horrors of thousands upon thousands of sexual abuse victims because of that man in BBC premises. Why do you think they allowed him to conduct himself so freely do, do in, you know what weak, under their name? Because these are weak people. These are weak people. You know, these are people that knew this man was doing this, knew it, and they didn't have the balls to stand up and prevent it. Because they're worried they were lost. Yeah, because they're weak. Because they're weak. And anyone who allows this to go on is weak. You know, these aren't people in positions of privilege and power. They're weak. You know, I'm not convinced by um, Esther Ranson's testimony. I'll leave it at that. And what she said in, in, in sort of um, confronting Jimmy Savile. 
I'm not convinced. I think they all knew and did nothing. I, I spoke to a victim of Savills who was in uh, Stoke Mandeville Prison, a Stoke Mandeville Hospital. Um, no, actually, well, I think it was Jimmy's Hospital in Leeds. And she was in there and Savile was visiting and the nurse come in and Savile um, started French kissing this girl. And she was only, she said he stunk of um, tobacco. She was nine years old, something like that, in wow. hospital ill. And then he climbed on top of her and, and sexually assaulted her. And all the nurse was did was turn her back. The nurse turned her back while he was doing it. So who is this nurse? How what, what what's going through this nurse's mind? That's mm. called cognitive dissonance. Oh my god, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. And then say to the girl, "Don't say anything. Please don't say anything." Cognitive dissonance, deliberately disowning, disconnecting a fact, right? And the distortion is when they turn around and blame the victim. You know, um, so we've seen it time and time again. It's very deviant. It's very disgusting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are devious, deceptive people. And when you talk to any survivors, that they will all give testimony of how these headmasters got away with it, how these other workers got away with it. One, one girl I know, she um, was in uh, a care home called Beach Home, and she walked in on, on a younger girl being raped by the, 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 the housemaster. So she went to the headmaster and reported him because she said, look, Mr. So-and-so was raping this little girl, you know. And so what they did was they caned her for reporting it, put it on there, and then they sectioned her. She got sectioned for life. They put her into a mental institution at the age of 13. For what? For what? Speaking out. Wow. You know, and, you know, she's a, a, one of the most stalwart campaigners. Her name is Sue. She is always outside Parliament campaigning, a good human being, you know, um, with, with another group. And they're all sort of in their late 70s, 80s now, and they still campaign consistently. I'd like to talk to her. Yeah, she's lovely. I'll put her in touch with her. her name's Sue. Yeah. And there's a guy called Alan Merritt. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're all from the same home. And, you know, they'll they'll give you their testimonies, what went on in, in these homes, um, what it did to their lives, you know, how it just destroyed them, you know. Mm. Um, but good people, they've got good hearts. And, yeah. and it hasn't, you know, I've, I've met some of them, the most damaged people I think I will ever meet you know, but I've met some of the most honourable people that will not go down. And if we talk about that, that that real British Tommy spirit that that, that took trenches in the First World War, these these are the people. These are these are warriors that will not go down. Went on to to have relationships, to have children, never laid a finger on their children um, or anything else. You know, okay, their lives could have been up and down, but full of honour, full of integrity but are full of terrible, terrible memories, shocking memories, and how they even get up in the morning and continue is a testimony. Are they managing their, their normal day-to-day -day life? Well, well they, 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 they do their best. I think years ago, people were very disciplined. You know, post-war Brits are different to Brits now. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone's on Prozac now. Everyone's medicated and, you know, crazy. But it was back then, there was none of that. It was shut your mouth, get on. Mm -hmm. So there was that 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 Victorian endeavour which sort of started to filter out in the seventies and the eighties, and opened its way into this, this sort of wokiness that we got now. But no, they don't. They don't get over it. They don't get over that. And um, you know, they're they're traumatised till they till they die. You know, and they get triggered as well. And um, you know, I know one guy. He can't he can't go to a restaurant, for example, or in a pub. Um, something will trigger him and that's it. He'll just go and smash someone. Really? Yeah, yeah. And it, someone will say something or they'll look a certain way. He can't stand middle-class accents or Scottish accents. Because that was his abusers. Abusers, yeah. He said the Scottish were always, whenever there was a Scotsman in the care homes, was always very, very violent. Um, so he, he doesn't like the Scottish accent and middle-class because he's, he remembers all the posh men will be brought in. You know, um, a good one for you to talk to is, is a guy called Darren Jeffries. His testimony is the most powerful I've ever, ever encountered. Really? He was one of the UK's most prolific armed robbers. I think he was, he got convicted of something like 50 armed robberies. He was like doing three a day. This guy was, you know, he was on it. Uh, but his childhood, I have never heard such a horrific testimony of what they did to this guy um, in his care home. And, and 
his abusers were were also the judges that put him there, and the probation workers. Wow. Were also his abusers. Yeah, and they tortured him, and they would take him and other boys to to a wooded area at night. Um, they would make them drink urine and and feces. Why why is that when it comes to doing things that that kind of remedy for torture is like you know drinking drinking yeah piss that, 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 that 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 starts dovetailing with ritualistic abuse because he said something to me and he said they took us to these woods um, in Bath in called Rainbow Woods again if you go to Bath it's oh, yeah, beautiful I know Bath I know Rainbow yeah, Woods yeah yeah beautiful you know yeah. but he said they'd go into Rainbow Woods these men would be brought in. There'd be about eight of the kids, and these men would pay money. He said it all were posh, and they'd all pick a boy, and then the boys were stripped naked and made to run through the woods, and they would then pursue them. The men would pursue them. He said they always caught us because there was nowhere to go. We couldn't hide. We were freezing cold. And yeah, they're definitely know, they know they know that they're going to catch them. These yep. kids, it's just giving them false hope that they can escape, isn't it? Yeah, false hope. And they would drag them back. They would whip them till they were bleeding you know whip them with sticks and then and then only rape them all and uh i said that's a satanic ritual and it's called the chase and it's it's a worship of a deity called moloch which is can be represented sometimes as an owl and because the owl will always torment its prey give it a sense of freedom before it kills it and it's a demonic it's worship of moloch this chasing kids through woods and then beating and raping them. And I said, and that's where, and the drinking of the piss. And, and, the, and the, he said that they would all piss in a bucket, these um, men in the care homes and shit in it. And we were all made to. I said, well, what if you didn't? He said, you would just be whipped and beaten and then raped, whipped, beaten and raped. And then what you have is some of the, the, the lads that endured horrific abuse, they can't keep it down a job. And I can remember in the police interviewing a guy and it was so sad. He got himself a job in an office and it didn't last. And there's two reasons why they, they see any sort of uh, dominion over them as, as abuse. So they can't work for people because it's power is abuse. So you're right? really disabling them in every part of in, their in, life. In every aspect. One guy couldn't even have a bank account because the bank had dominion over his money. And he saw that as coercive. But also, the other reason they can't work in a group environment is the fact that they defecate themselves. They shit in their pants, right? Because they've been anally raped from such a young age. Their bowel, they're damaged. Their sphincter muscle is damaged. And, and uh, an anus is not like a vagina. A vagina is like, like a wall of muscle like that. And it's designed to stretch beyond reason and then go back again. So that's why women can have 14, 15 kids and still her husband can have pleasure out of having sex with her. You can't do that to an anus. An anus is what's called a sphincter muscle. A sphincter is, is, is a, like a chain. It's all little muscles like that, all link in to form a chain. And when you, when you breach a sphincter muscle, you break those links. So to the outside world... The sphincter will look like it's back to normal, but it's not. It's of no use. It's just a cosmetic covering up, which doesn't work anyway. So that would just allow feces and, and, and gas to just come out, and they can't control it. So they can't work with other people because they will fart and smell the place out, and they will shit their pants, and some have to wear incontinent knickers and things like that. Um, the women can't have children, some of them, because their wombs are twisted. Because a man's penis should never go into an infant girl's vagina. And it pushes the womb, it misaligns it, so that women have problems having children, because their wombs, they'll say, oh, well, there's something wrong with here, because your womb is, is tilted. And that's a clear sign of sexual abuse. They will have problems with their back sitting down, because their spine would have been damaged through, through anal sex through a penis going inside the back uh, and damaging their back so you will have a lot of people with back problems as well and these are all indicators that sexual abuse has gone on and this is what they should be teaching in schools in colleges you know and their workplaces things to look out for i mean there is there is a a, a large 
question mark as to why, you know, many things ain't taught at school. This being one of them within um, within the academic structure, along with um, financial, um, you know, learning how to handle financial yeah. stuff and that. But I mean, is it is it the reason why it's not being um, shown in school because the powers that are involved with it, where if you was raising awareness to it, people were more likely to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, and look at the wokiness of everything now. You know, everyone's right to be offended. I don't care if I offend an adult. I've got no interest in if offending an adult. It, it's good. <laughs> exactly. it, like, it, it, yeah. shouldn't be, it shouldn't be offense. Yeah. But the problem is, that is the problem. Yeah. People... <coughs> Sorry, people can handle a lie more than they can handle the truth. Of course. And, you know, there's that song by the Manic Street Preachers, if we tolerate this, then our children will be next. And we are tolerating perversion and nonsense for the sake... Of, there, there was, a, 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 again, the people I talked to, I, I am in the process of writing a book uh, and putting a lot of this down, committing a lot of this... Um, I get a lot of prostitutes, ex-prostitutes, active prostitutes contact me. Um, a lot of women that go into that world. There's there, there's a lot of trauma. There is a lot of trauma in there. Uh, a lot of the prostitutes that I end up talking to are lesbians as well because men hurt them. Again, you know, there, there might be sometimes deeper questions to why people choose a certain thing. There might be trauma there. Does that work out for men as well? Uh, like, because, um, like... Um... Like if a if a boy gets abused sexually abused by a woman, do they then revert to being gay because of the damage? Well, it, that's it, it could happen. Now, again, you know, I, I spoke to spoke to one guy. Um, I'll just get back to the prostitute thing. Yeah, right? sorry. And then, I, then I'll answer that one. Um, th this woman's given a talk on on sort of sexual trafficking and all this. She's uh, talking about her life in the porn industry, and you know, and how disgusting it is, and and you know how we we need to protect girls from this. And um, she, when she was there, there was an MP um, in, in, in the forum and she sort of recognised him. Anyway, she's gone back, Googled him. She said, I know this guy. And he's got a conviction for um, child pornography. Right, an MP. He's got a conviction. And so she turned around and said, I, I, I don't want this man on the panel. He is a paedophile. This guy turned around, and this is a brass neck of this man. He's an MP with a conviction, caution, whatever it might be, for child porn. He said, I'm not a paedophile. I'm a minor attracted person. They call themselves this acronym MAP. And he thought that that was okay to say that. He was proud to say that. And then they, he said, she said, then the forum then gave him to a timeout safe space that these woke morons had put aside where he was then convalesced because he was insulted. Not the fact that he'd been watching children being sexually abused or whatever it might be. The moat's a monster and a paedophile and a pervert. No, he was now the victim, according to... And she, she was the one that was removed. So what have we become? How twisted? How, again, cognitive distortion. Protecting the evil. How, exactly, it's flipping it. Turning around now, blaming the victim... And, and, and hiding the truth and embellishing the lie. Um, there's, um, I, I, honestly, I can put you in touch with people that will give testimonies that, that are life-changing. There's th th these two phenomenal um, individuals. They're twins, and uh, they identical twins, and they were in a, a care home in, in Northern Ireland. They're, they're Catholics, and... They um, were put into this care home. Their dad was an alcoholic or something. I don't know what happened. And at the age of eight, they were put in their first night. The priest came in, held, two priests held the boys down while they got the other boys to line up and anally rape them. This was their first night. They didn't even know what a penis was, these boys, apart from the winkle they have a wee with, you know. And these priests then got the other boys to rape them, right? So 14, 11, 12-year-old boys, then bumming them. Um, that was their first night. They were then taken the next day before the head priest, all, all the brothers, the De La Salle brothers, it came out in an inquiry, we can talk about it. Um, uh, they were then made to suck off the head priest or whatever he was. Uh, they were then 
over a period of time were taken to orgies where it would just be all priests raping them. They were then made to rape each other. They were met, they're twin brothers. They're, they're like, if you meet them, both joined the military and they're, they're toughies, you know, and they both raped each other and were made to suck each other off while priests sat around and masturbated. And one of them said, all I ever knew was men's cocks. That's all I knew. And I left the care home to just throw you out in the street. And he said he'd, he'd go to areas where there were men cruising because that's all I knew. And he said, one day I was in a pub and I met a girl and I kissed her and I realised I weren't gay. Yeah, wow. I realised that I love women, but I'd never been into all I knew. And he said I was actively going out trying to find male partners because that's what was programmed into him through the abuse. Wow. Now, again, th th this isn't me speaking for the gay community or anything like that. I don't want anyone to get offended by what I say and saying, John Major says this. I, this ain't, I'm just talking about testimonies that have come to me. Yeah. I'm no expert in gender and, and I'm not attributing homosexuality to abuse. However, I've spoken to a lot of homosexuals that have come from trauma. That's all I'll say on that matter, you know. Um, so, you know, there's all these, these issues. And how do you process that? So is, is he now married? Married to the, yeah, to, yeah. The, to, the, to the lady? They both got married, went on to have kids, you know. And they're, How they're, amazing must that have been for him? Yeah. To have that, that feeling of, like... These, these guys, right? So they tried to report this abuse. And the police kept covering up, covering up, covering up. Right, so they walked in to a police station in the West Midlands and they said, we need to report abuse. Right, because a lot of it, it did involve the IRA were involved in it. Again, this is what I said about organised criminals. You know, they will do anything for money. I'm not knocking, I do a lot with ex-criminals now. and In no way am I pointing the finger saying they're part of this. I'm not. But there are organised criminal gangs that make a lot of money through child pornography and child procurement and there are um like i said earlier there were two very infamous ones that were heavily involved in it um political parties the ira i've heard that they have been involved in it um i've also heard that the other side has been involved in 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 procuring kids for sex parties but then it would be used in as a bribery tool against the other side in 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 the peace agreements in ireland we we've seen that with um Kirk Corbyn Kids Home and there was another one, um, a Protestant one in that was a Catholic one, a Protestant one in Ireland. Very, very infamous care home in which kids were were used as a sex toy for bribery purposes for, for a lever on the peace agreement. And again, head of our military intelligence at the time, Sir Peter Heyman was a convicted paedophile, got convictions for, for offences against boys. Um, I can I, I, do, I do a whole talk on that, all on fact, you know. We've had five prime ministers whose, whose political advisors have been convicted paedophiles, five prime ministers. Wow. And that's not on top of that, Ted Heath being an active paedophile, stroke Satanist as well at the same time. You know, so this is, where do you go? So these boys wanted to report what had happened to them and it just kept fobbed off, fobbed off, fobbed off because it was political as well. So that what they did was they took a gun and a petrol into the police station and they poured petrol over themselves. They said, you will listen to us. You will listen to us. And they produced a lighter. They said, if you don't get a copper down here to take a basic crime report, we, we, we blow ourselves up. So one of them said, he looked, next thing he looks around and there's a red dot on him. <laughs> they got marksmen out. Marksman out yeah. And he said, if you shoot us, it, the bullet's going to trigger the, you know, the heat of the bullet will burn us and you're going to burn everyone in here. So they they decided then to taser them. Well, so they sent a guy down with a taser and, and it was like, are you, are you mentally, are you stupid? You know, West Midlands police, um, in the end, a superintendent come down and they said, we just want to talk. We will put down our lighters. You know, you can put everything where you can have fire extinguishers and douses and everything, but just please, before you do it, take our report. And, and, and fair play to the guy, he did. They were imprisoned for criminal damage to endanger life, you know, uh, threats to criminal damage to endanger life and got a prison sentence. But the Sun newspaper took up their story. And uh, incredible boys. They, again, they campaign all throughout the country. 
And the one thing you'll find with this community of, of people that speak out, whistleblowers, whatever, apart from the occasional idiot and nutcase, because there are the occasional, and one of them is ex copper is an absolute pain in the arse, a nut, he's a nutcase. Um, the rest of them, all of us have never had a bad word against each other, Not none. We all stand up for each other. I have been attacked and trolled more probably than any, more than David Icke, I think. Um, but again, it doesn't matter. You've just got to realise that hurt people hurt people. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of damaged people out there. There's a lot of people with, with guilt, with guilt on their minds. And they don't want you talking because they're guilty. They know what they've done, you know. And there's a lot of people in the survivor community with guilt on their minds as well. And there is, you know. Um, but amongst that, there's some brilliant, phenomenal people. And, and that's... The main reason I carried on doing what I was doing, you know, uh, because it was working. And, and I have got emails and letters. I can't tell you how much from people saying, thank you, you saved my life. If it weren't for you, I'd have committed suicide. Thank you. Thank you for well, that's service. a gas goose pimple kind of material. Yeah, yeah. It's like. so, so do you know when, um, you know, when paedophiles, <clears throat> have you got paedophiles? And then you've got paedophiles that are in the satanic ritual, or is it all hand in hand? Yeah, yeah it's, it's all pretty much the same, because it's down to choice, right? So you could turn around and blame the devil made me do it, but it ain't good enough. You chose to do it. So it's all down to choice. At the end of the day, what is the act they do? They rape a kid, well, they're a paedophile. Whether they're worshipping the devil, they're worshipping Paimon, Leviathan, or, or the ancient um, Ochons that they have in... in voodoo and opia and all them you know at the end of the day the fact of the matter is you defiled a kid you've raped a kid mm. it's rape you're a paedophile you're a rapist uh, and, I, and i would say that anyone whether they worship satan or not if they sexually abuse or rape a child they're doing the devil's job they're doing the work of the devil it's evil you know leave the kids alone there's plenty of people out there you can pay them to do what you want with them you know I, I, you leave I, the kids I, alone yeah i've i mean I've got um, I've got ten kids myself. I've got five daughters, five <laughs> sons. Yeah, well, I, you beat I, me then. I've got four, but <laughs> ten, wow. yeah, I've got five daughters, five sons, and oh my god, I it doesn't even bear thinking about no, the you, world that we've brought them into, you know. But you wouldn't. It just wouldn't. I can always remember once uh, I was interviewing a, a little Jamaican boy, and he'd been raped, and they'd given him HIV. And he was a skinny little boy. And this was back when people were dying of HIV. You, you don't die from it now. But back then, you know, it was going, I think it was actually going on to AIDS. And he was being bullied. And they didn't want him in the playground in case he had a fight with someone. And he put blood on, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? Which you can sort of see to a degree. But he was telling me, he was explaining to me, it was his uncle come over from Jamaica and raped him. And he was just sitting there, this tiny little boy, and he was so polite and he was such a sweet kid. And and I thought, and he was in care. And I thought, who's tucking you in at night? You're telling me this. This is clearly upsetting him. I go home. Where do you go? You know, where do you go? And he knew what had happened to his body. And he knew that he was now infected in a terminal way. He knew it. And he was sat there. And I just wanted to hug him. And it was the only time it broke me, and I and I, I stopped the interview. I, I got what I needed, and I stopped it, and I said to the operator, "I'm I'm, I'm going home. I'm I'm off." And they went, "Where are you going?" And all I wanted to do was hug my children. I just wanted to go home and get all my boys together and hug them, and tell them I loved them. And I and I and I just thought it just it haunted me. Who tucks these kids in at night? You know, when someone said to me, "You're brave," listen, my bravery is nothing compared. To them poor little kids in oh, them care yeah. homes hiding under them blankets and they hear that door that dormitory go and they know one of them's getting it so we get in the bed take it for granted we get in the bed and just be like oh, I'm knackered yeah. sit there crash out get up in the morning like oh, some of these kids they're not sleeping at night they're getting sleep deprivated because they're too afraid to sleep this is it this is this is it so you get we go on about this 80 percent that we mentioned at the very start of this. So 80% of the prison population will come from abuse backgrounds, okay? Fact. 80% of the prisoners re-offend, right? It's got an 80% re-offending. Fact. 80%, I think it's of the under 25 in the lower category prisons are, are what they call 
level A1 illiterate, right? They're illiterate, 80%, or it might be 75%, but it's in that ballpark, illiterate, cannot read or write to a basic standard. This needs looking at, why? Well, when, when you're coming from trauma, you're hypervigilant. And when you talk to a lot of them back in the day that were in the care homes, they were awake all night because they were too frightened. And during the day, they couldn't concentrate. Their minds couldn't take anything in because they were tired and worn out. They were in survival mode every day of their lives. And they didn't take any education in because they couldn't. They were too frightened. And that come a lot from these big institutional cottage homes and all that, you know. And that was one of the things that, that you know, I thought this needs talking about, you know. And that's why you're going to get so many of them. And then they can't articulate. And if you can't articulate, you limit your expression. If you limit your expression, then what are you going to do? You're going to resort to violence or, or, or anger to get it out there because you can't do it any other way. So it, they suffer on all levels, you know. So when, <clears throat> when you've got these um, places where these children end up, you've got the government and the private sectors of, of where these, these go, just like schooling, you've got private schools now. Is there, is there like a percentage that's higher than the other what are getting abused? Is there as much going on in the private homes as there is um, the um, government-run children's homes? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it's now gone out to tender. A lot of it's contract. It's money. It all comes down to money. Whatever way we look at it, it's money. Even with a satanic abuse, it's money. It's business. It's money. You know, so these care homes, they can have five children. They can get two grand per child per week. That's 10 grand a week, 40 grand a month. And what are they doing with the kids? Nothing. So the kids are preyed on. So when they leave, there's there's men waiting for these, these kids. So when the kids are coming back from school, there's boys pulling up. And they call them Romeos, you know chatting to these young girls, oh, what are you doing? You're lovely and all that. Mm-hmm. And we know it now as grooming. You know, um, I dealt with, um, it was mainly Kosovans back then that were doing it from Kosovo, ethnic Albanians that were, were set out to, to Romeo these girls and then to bring them into the brothels and get them working in the brothels. And the care homes were doing nothing because they were getting their money. And, it, and of course, the girls weren't saying nothing because the girls were earning money. But they were just being used as prostitutes, you know, 14, 15 year old girls. And then they go missing. So we get these stats and children go missing from care. OK, well, what happens to them? No one was bothering to debrief them. We were debriefing them. We were ahead of our game. There's two of us, me and another girl. We were debriefing them. What, what's going on? Well, being picked up and you take them to this brothel with a sauna, this, that. You know, you get, get any local paper going about saunas, saunas. These blokes that go visiting these saunas, you know, they're, they're fueling mm. child child prostitution. They are, they're fueling child prostitution. And you get on it, you know, the girl's 18-year-old, 18 18-year-old, 18 she'll be 16. Yeah. You know, don't kid yourself, mate. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it's wrong. It's So, so it's a very, uh, for, for those that are not paedophilic in any way, but do love prostitutes, um, for prostitution or brasses uh, in, in many ways have been described, um, for those that are sleeping with these girls that they have been told they're 18, if they're 18, they don't know they're 16, is they still classing as that because there is some awareness that it possibly is that they're younger? Well, well the, the brothel don't care. Uh, they'll ask them to fill out a pro forma. Well, where's a legally bond? Where's the background checks on that? None. It's all down to money. You know, we would drag, we would raid the brothels looking for the young girls and you'd find them usually. Um, it's usually when they'd be advertised as 18 and all that. And, and you'd drag them out. And nothing was really done uh, towards a brothel, you know. Um, uh, and especially the, the clients that were going in there. You know, people would specifically ask for these girls. Um, but, but what was strange is how you'd go in is I'd go in as a punter. And I'd go in through the door, pay a tenner. And I'd keep the door open. And then... That you know, the heavy mob would come. You'd have you'd have a little team with you, and you'd then bomb burst through the building. You just run through the building, um, maybe disconnect, take the phone off the um, the maid. The, these maids are in on it, so don't these don't ever have them say, "Oh, I just as a receptionist." Bullshit! You know what goes on, mm-hmm. and you choose to do nothing. It's a shame on you. So I've got no respect for these women that work as maids at all because they were all part of it, 
and as much as they claim they weren't bollocks right we then bomb burst through the building just jumping on everyone and anyone you know um and legally our only reason was there was to look for children you know uh young girls and on the whole you would find them you know um saunas there was a lot of them you know um holloway road there was one there that we, we we dragged young girls out of um uh finsbury park or north london lots in north london what's the youngest age that you pulled out of there uh i think 15 14 15 um whereas the ones on the street they were nine they were young you can't work them in brothels see, see there's a world of difference between the brothel and the street you know um, they go on about legalising prostitution. Well, you know, if you want a prostitute, you can get one anyway. It's all on the internet now anyway, so it's pretty much legal. A, a brothel has to be two women. It can't be one. One woman working in a house is not a brothel. If you've got two, it's a brothel. And it comes under strict legislation. And there's strong legislation that children aren't allowed to be in there. Um, so when they're going about, they uh, get prostitution off the street. These are heroin addicts that work the street. You know, they're doing it because they're in trouble. Right, you will always have. You couldn't have a brothel with heroin addicts and crackheads, girls working in there. I mean, it'd be like chaos, wouldn't it? It'd be like herding cats. It'd just be pure madness. You're always going to have the street scene. But we used to police it, right? Um, and we was on the street, you know. And they would get nicked. Okay, it weren't a perfect system, but you've got to know all the girls, and then you've got that volley of information would come back. And on the whole, they were pretty on board with you because they were victims and survivors of abuse themselves. So you did have that mutual respect. There were some nasty ones, but there were some good people, you know, that life just went the wrong way. And if they knew of a kid, they'd tell you. Or if they knew of a punter that wanted a kid, they'd tell you. Right, so you've got all these this left-wing intervention, legalise it and have these free zones. But what they found happened was when the police were told, leave these girls alone, they started getting attacked. They started getting beaten up again because the police had gone. Criminality came back. Whereas when the vice squads were out there, you know, you'd deal with anything. You know, I, 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 I've had my ribs broken. Um, someone tried to stab me and kill me one night in King's Cross. A pimp tried to stab me. Um, you, you know, you'd have all that. And there was firearms would sometimes be would come across. But we policed it at the same time. And the girls actually were happy for that because we gave them a level of protection they didn't get. And they found this now in Leeds, where they've now got these safe zones and that, where the police aren't allowed to patrol these red light areas. Violence against women has gone through the roof, rocketed. But what, what was very interesting was that was a basic standard brothel raid, how you would, you, you, you would do over a brothel. And... Um, you know, you'd, you the money would be bagged up and, and everything, and then it'd go on to a, an immoral earnings financial investigation team, which would then start looking at who run a brothel, and usually they, they'd have probably Cyprus for some reason. Everyone seemed to live in Cyprus. So there was always teams going out to Cyprus and Lithuania and places like that, you know, nicking these brothel owners. Um, one day there was info about a, a male brothel and this is where it starts getting very, very weird. Uh, and this was in Earl's Court. And it was probably the only male brothel, really. Uh, the, the, the male vice scene is very different to the female vice scene. Very, very different. Um, the boys on the street, sometimes you'd get around the meat rack, around Piccadilly. That sort of started to die out. Uh, and it, it moved. The young boys moved into the gay clubs. So these gay clubs, like up the Charing Cross Road, Shaftesbury Avenue and that, were, were, were procuring, they were, they were in on, on the, the procurement of young boys. A lot of the lads would say, no, they, the governor knows we're in here. And these boys look, whereas the girls were trying to look older, right? Um, so the 15 and 14-year-old girls would pass as 18, you know? You'd sit there and think, well, yeah, maybe she is. It's only yeah. when you'd find their birth certificates or whatever. Um, you know, or their immigration papers, you realise they were children or they were in the care homes and the care homes said, actually, she's, she's 16. So the girls, you know, however, the street stuff with the girls, they clearly were little girls, you know. So, again, the street scene is different to the brothel scene. Mm -hmm. Stuff goes on in the street, the brothels wouldn't allow it, you know. The brothels would never entertain a nine-year-old girl in there, never. No. 
it would just be they would call you up you know that would that would fuck everything up so um so but the the gay clubs were allowing these young boys 13 12 year old boys to actively be picked up in these clubs and and we used to get testimony after testimony interview after interview of these young boys saying that the manager of these certain clubs well-known gay clubs knew there were young boys in there so it went from from the meat rack where they were being picked up at a wimpy bar and taken off it then went into the gay club and that become problematic to police it you know um so whenever you start looking into the gay scene involving paedophilia it got very political very quickly so there was a brothel in Ells court and they said, right, we're going to raid this brothel, right, looking for um, underage boys and, and immigration offences. So, again, they said to me, will you go in first? I went, yeah, yeah, okay. So I went in and they said, but this is different. So whereas before I would go in, the door, pay my money and then just keep the door open and then the squad would come in and just jump on everyone, you know. Um, this was different. So I knocked on the door. Uh, I had to then show them my police badge my detective badge, so I'm a detective from the vice unit. Then they'd shut the door. Then a manager would come down from this brothel, always well spoken. And it was say it was just around the back of Ells Court, uh, Nevin Place, I think, just around the back of Ells Court um, tube station. So we'd go, and then this guy would come and collect me and then ask me how many officers I had with me. So they'd all that come forward then, all had to identify themselves. We were taken to a waiting room. Bear in mind the time scale, the element of surprise has gone, yeah. long gone, you know. We were sat down, we were given a pot of tea, how civilised, you know, they're sodomising young boys and we're given a pot of tea. And then we had to wait until the brothel owner's solicitor turned up to monitor the search. And that could take an hour. And that was deemed acceptable by the vice unit. Wow. It was acceptable by the vice unit that that was a disparity between how we dealt with the straight girls in a brothel and how we dealt with the gays in a brothel. And it was disgusting, absolutely appalling. And, you know, and young boys were sometimes dragged out of there, you know. Um, but when you look at all these sort of old um, scandal programmes about these MPs with young boys and, you know, and you think this is why it never comes to light because it is protected at high levels. It sounds like, you know, from here and from start to finish, it all sounds very um, cloak and dagger with yep. um, protecting people that, because if you went to the top and you took the top one down, the rest are going to fall. Yeah, yeah. And it's a dirty little secret. So they all have to protect each other to make sure that it doesn't start falling I, to pieces. I, You know, I've spoken to survivors from across the board and I'm contacted by a guy. And his father's a very, very well-known lord, right? Got a big palatial um, manor house in Hampshire. And this is the lord's son. I think the lord, lord is dead now. Again, I won't name him, you know. But um, anyway, this Viscount, wherever he is, he said, John, I'd really like to, for you to come along to one of my talks. And he gives a talk about his life as a victim of child sexual abuse by his father, who's this lord. And he said to me, the people you deal with, John, he said, that they come from the lower and the working classes. I said, yes, they, they do. And he said, do you get many middle class victims? I said, yeah, some, some. Again, it's a reserved community. But, you know, the lower and the middle classes mainly, you know. And he said, I'm from the ruling classes. Yeah. And he said, we don't get any justice. What does that mean, the ruling? The ruling classes, the, the upper classes, oh, you know, okay. the, the lords, the ladies, yeah. you know, the royalty, you know. Uh, I think he's, he's, he's related to the royals, this guy. And he said, my father raped me. Uh, members of Winston Churchill's cabinet raped me. Um, when I was nine years old, he said, I was raped by uh, one of the monsignors at Eton, Eton Elite College, you know, preparatory school. And he said, the fagging system in Eton is nothing more than a rent boy racket. If you, if you don't know about the fagging system, it's where the older boys are allowed governance over the younger boys and they get them to do their chores. Mm. But part of their chores would be to, to to suck them off and have sex with them. And it was tolerated, it was allowed. And he said it was rife. And he said, if I speak out, they never listened to me. He said, when I went to the police, it just got covered up. 
at least when the lower classes report it, it does get investigated, although it don't go anywhere. It don't, he said, but when my class, the elite class, investigate, it goes nowhere because of who they are. You know, and Eaton, you know, Eaton has seen, I mean, it, it, is, it has made, there's been more prime ministers come out of Eaton than any other learned establishment. It's seen as a bastion of excellence for education of young boys throughout the world. And he was just saying it was just nothing more than a rent boy racket. You know, I was being raped by older boys and I was being raped by by the staff. And if you said anything, you were caned, violently caned. And then you were raped. And that was it. And that's Eaton. You know, so it's it, it, what is it about young boys and rape and, and the upper echelons of British society? And the secret society to do with paedophilia is... I didn't realise just how messy well, but controlled it all is. We, we, we look at, there was a man called Bishop Peter Ball, uh, bishop for, for the south coast of England. So he covered like Arundel, Brighton, all this, the whole huge area. He was in governance and he was raping boys and, and one went on to commit suicide. So he got blood on his hands mm. and he was protected for 15 years um, by the royal family because he was he was best friends with Prince Charles. He's dead now, Peter Ball. It came out in the inquiry. This came out in the government inquiry. Um, and he did eventually get convicted. But um, many allegations were made to the police, I think especially to Surrey police, who again dismissed it. Sussex police, they again, they dismissed it. Do you think that if these people that are now known as some of the biggest paedophiles in a celebrity status, if they were still alive, that it was still being covered up? Um, they were still alive, yeah. Well, it's difficult because what, what, once this pack of, the house of cards falls, you know, once one speaks out, it all goes. That's why Savile, there was a conspiracy of silence around Savile. Look who was connected with Savile. You look at people like Max Clifford, you know, who was running one of the big media moguls, He's dead now, but a convicted paedophile, you know. Again, so the stories that were going to him, what was he covering up? Mm. You know, and, and you've just, like I said to earlier, don't just look at those that do it. Look at those that fail to do anything about it, who cover it up. Yeah. Again, look at, you know, Bishop Ball, who was his, his, his boss, the Archbishop of Canterbury, did nothing, did nothing. And now he's a Lord, Lord Carey in the House of Lords. What position has he got and what is he doing to curtail sexual abuse in, in the church? Nothing. You know, you had you had Cardinal McCormick, Murphy McCormick O'Connor. Um, his name cropped up as being an, an active Satanist. He was a cardinal for the UK. His name was on the Reigns list, the satanic list that was produced and given to the police. You know, he's a cardinal for the Catholic Church. What, 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 you know, honestly, when you, when you plot it out, lay it out, and you stick with the facts, again, this isn't conspiracy, you stick with the facts... And you see people like Sir Peter Heyman, head of MI6, again, convicted paedophile, and his friends, and who he was connected with. And we see what the allegations against Leon Britton, Home Secretary. We see the allegations against Lord Janner. None of them went to trial because it was covered up, covered up, covered up. And, and then subsequently, all these commissioners of police and special branch were covering it up. There, were, there was a group called PI, Paedophile Information Exchange, that advocated um, sex with boys uh, under the age of seven. Um, and they were given like a polit political lobby by the Labour Party, um, by three right honourable Labour politicians who patronised this group and even allowed them to speak at their, their annual conference at the London, London School of Economics, a pro paedophile group. And it was a campaign for civil liberties that were a fraction off of the, uh, the Labour Party. Then now this, they formed into this um, civil liberties group called Liberty. And they're always talking, they've always got their spokeswoman, Chakrabarti, speaking on, on Good Morning Telly about people's civil rights. Well, the inception of this group was patronising a pro-paedophile group. Harriet Harman herself, the Right Honourable MP, who went on to become Minister for Children. She advocated the, the um, age of consent to be 14 with girls. Went on to be a Minister for Children. It's sick to the core. You haven't got to look far. These are hard facts that have come out. Unfortunately, people don't take any interest in the news and the press and the media anymore. They, they, they're they too interested watching TikTok and nonsense and crap and bullshit. And and people say to me, what do we tell, what, what advice would you give to children? I say, take an interest in politics. 
take an interest in politics and start taking the political forum back for yourselves. Stop allowing these elite perverts to do what they want, who've got nothing but contempt for you anyway, are making a huge amount of money and are covering up the most abhorrent crimes. Take an interest and do something and start standing up. And when when something is uncovered, there should be a, a, a public inquiry every time. And when there is a chief constable of police that is seen to cover up a major crime involving a celebrity, again, a public inquiry, everyone should be held accountable. If they don't, they're removed from post mm -hmm. and they are charged with offences such as malfeasance <laughs> in a public office and they are prosecuted for failing to do it because if we tolerate it, our children will be next, like the song says. So um, we've got a long way to go, but, you know, I, honestly, I, I talk for hours and hours and it goes off on these different tangents, but it's all the same premise, the whole same premise. There is failing after failing after failing. And we need to bring all this out. And I say to people, speak out. Yeah, it's all about the message. Speak out. And, <clears throat> and, and if victims and survivors here um, want my advice, if you've been abused and you haven't told anyone, go and tell the police. Tell them. Tell them. Doesn't matter if it's a family member. Doesn't matter who it is. If they're dying of cancer or this, tell the police. Make a report. Get it on record. You never know. It might get investigated, you know. And, and with justice comes healing. You know, is it easy to pick up on a historic case? No, it's difficult. It's difficult. What, it's a painful journey. What would be your advice to someone that has gone their whole life, um, that has been sexually abused by somebody from when they were younger? Well, to, well to... my advice to them is, well, be words of compassion. You've done nothing wrong. They did it to you. You had no choice. You were a victim, you know, and God bless you. And, and don't give up. Um, don't fall foul. Get the justice you deserve. And with that justice will come healing. Stand up. These aren't monsters anymore. These are people. These are weak people. You know, when you portray something as a monster, it's an ogre. It's something you can't combat. These aren't monsters. These are weak maggots. These are pond life. These are bacteria. And the fact that you're still alive now is a testimony to your strength. And speak out. Speak out and report these vile people. They can't hurt you anymore. Right, they couldn't even hurt you back then, but it was how they controlled your mind and they put people in the fear of their lives. The fact that they have to do that means they're weak and they're cowards. Right? Anyone, anyone who, who preys on a child is a coward. They are not a strong person, right? And stand up and the fact that you're still here shows your strength and God bless you. And I'm with you. If you, if you want any advice, John Wedger, J-O-N-W-E-D-G-E-R, foundation at gmail.com i can't promise uh, anything but i do what i do is i i do get in touch with people and, and i show them the protocol of reporting crime the protocol of of complaining if it's not investigated properly it is a hard process i can't i can't do it for you unfortunately i haven't got the means the resources or the time but i can impart my experience and i have helped quite a few people report crimes and i can put you in touch with people as well help groups and things like that you're not alone and you did nothing wrong excellent advice yeah yeah it's been absolutely amazing mate a definite eye opener um it had me pretty just uh, i was on edge the whole time every time you were saying something i was shifting myself around the chair because i just didn't believe like all this stuff is actually happening um and then being covered up as well it's it's absolutely crazy and I hope that this message is reaching out to all the people to come forward to be able to start um, acting against them and putting them. I don't, I don't even know how to say them. It's really blown my mind. This has and, and well, there's always a positive note. I mean, when when I team up with with people like Anthony Roberts, an ex arm robber, and um, we go out there and raise money and put a message across and, and help things with people like Chris Lambiano when I team up with him. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'll put you in touch with Chris oh, yeah. and with Darren. And and th there's hope, you know, um, especially when you see the, the sterling work that Anthony's doing. Yeah. It, it, you know, I, I'm so proud of what that guy's achieved. 100%. And it's not the system that changes them. They change themselves. You know, they find the strength in themselves. And that's what I'm saying to anyone who's surviving, 
look, look, I can I can put Paul in touch with with survivors with phenomenal testimonies that have got nothing but hope. They do get on with their lives and they go on to achieve incredible things and help others. And these are the people that survivors want to talk to. They want to listen to these positive messages. There is hope. There is light. Life does go on. And, and we're on the winning side. And let's not let um, these people divide us. What happens is these groups set up and then doubt gets in. Trolling gets in. Don't listen to the trolling. Don't listen to the negativity. Don't let it divide us. We, we cannot have a fag papers gap between what we do. We must all stand together, you know, and all push forward because there's enough enemies out there without survivors attacking each other, which which does tend to happen. So um, stay away from the negative stuff. Um, you know, you can get caught down the rabbit hole with the conspiracy yeah. things and all that. The Masons are doing this and all this sort of stuff. You know, be very careful of that. Stick to the facts. Um, but for me, it's nothing but positivity. It drives me. I know that I'm doing what God wants me to do. Yeah, I can see you know? that as well. And 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 I and I'm, I'm I enjoy doing it. I mm. enjoy doing it, and and I feel stronger when I do it. I'm glad to be part of that message as well. Yeah. I really appreciate you. God loves you. Jesus loves you. He hates people who hurt children, and uh, and He's bringing His army together. And I'm telling you, we've got some good people, and we're we're not far off getting a very very good result very very soon. Excellent. So, um, that's amazing. Satanists beware, you know. We're, yeah, hundred percent. We're coming, man. We're coming, and we're 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 doing good. We're doing good, but it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, you know, uh, any opportunity I get to speak, I always take it. You was recommended um, by Anthony, and uh, uh, thank you so much for having me on. You thank know. you so much for God taking bless. the time <laughs> to come down here today. I really, really no worries. Once meeting you, hearing your journey, hearing your future plans with pushing the message more forward. Yeah. Um, the hookups we're going to get from this too yeah. and um, future things that I hope we can still do later on with other things yeah. um, to do with Anthony and yourself yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, it, and, and many others. It's just starting. What we've got to do is start tapping into the government funding. There is money there that the Home Secretary um, has put out you know, because the system is failing and they're calling out for independent groups now to intervene and get involved. And there's what you mean, there. like the paedophile hunters and that? Like? I think they're doing a cracking job. Yeah, uh, I think that's one of the uh, the best bit of sort of um, civilian action that we've had. Uh, we've always had it with with store detectives, but what they're doing now, they're very professional. I'm I'm not a fan of them live streaming the the arrests and all that because some of these um, people they're catching are very damaged and. You know, you've only got to get someone kill themselves in a death in custody and there's mm -hmm. going to be ramifications because you're part of that custody process because you're taking away someone's liberty. So, But I've seen a huge improvement in, in their MO, how they operate, and I'm, I'm very impressed with them. And we can take this a lot further. You know, we if the police are failing, then let's be an alternative. Mm -hmm. We've now got a team together. We've got um, capabilities for ground penetrating radar. We've just finished um, a monumental search um, for some missing children, I uh, believe, buried. Um, oh, ground penetrate. Oh, right. Oh, radar. Wow. Yeah, yeah, we've got that. Um, we, we've got experts on, on, on plant analysis. We've got the best cadaver dogs in the world that will team up with us, all independently come in. We've got experts in field craft. Um, we've, got, we've got professional statement takers that will go out and take statements where the police have failed. Just done it myself been taking statements and served some statements on, on, on a constabulary um, regarding missing children. So we're, we're, we're doing it. We're actually doing it now um, ourselves, whereas where they're failing to do it, we can, um, we can be a viable alternative. Do you feel like a lot of the times that the reason why some of the police, even though they have got the love for it, they don't tend to push their love for the job forefront of their pension yeah that see this is it it's a pension yeah that, that is it i have i've come across this a lot with uh, my charity and and pushing for yeah. the greater good with knife crime yeah. and um, a lot of them they agree with me but they yeah. won't stand with and me because frightened. they're frightened they're going to yeah. lose their pension yeah and this is what they do they try to take my pension off me they, they do it with all of us you know and and that unfortunately that's what you're up against yeah so and i don't blame them but um, we've got to show them there's another way, you know, uh, but we, we are building a very, very viable 
alternative and we're getting a lot of information in. I share everything with the police. I don't like some of the um, senior officers I've had to deal with. We've got uh, an ex-chief constable working with us who is incredible. He's got connections now with, with the government, the ministers. Um, I've been in communication with the assistant prime minister. We, we got banned, um, access to a bit of land, a bit of very highly sensitive government land. And I managed to get it overturned recently and we managed to get on there and search the land, uh, which was fruitful to a degree. Unfortunately, we never found any cadavers. But um, so we're really, really doing some very, very good stuff. And we're using civil legislation to do it as well. So it's achievable. Amazing. And this is what we've got to do. And this is why these paedophile groups are very, very important. I think there's a matter now of upping the game and taking it to the next step. Um, I think we should be now uh, as civilian groups looking at the missing children what's actually happened to them and you're probably going to find that you know these kids have actually been murdered um and it's been covered up one way or the other so um and you know anyone that, that has any information just just come forward um i mean there's not a great deal i can do as an individual but so i say i have been using my spare time taking statements um to a good court standard and they've been served on the police and then we're trying to get all other professionals in. We've, we've got um, one of the best psychiatrists in mental health working with us as well. Uh, we've got an FBI profiler. We've just done a profile on a convicted murderer. Um, and the profile's come back that he's killed more children. You know, he's, Wow. Um, but unfortunately, the prison system aren't allowing us access to go and talk to him. He's, he's, he's ill. He's old. And he's ready to talk. And the prison system won't let me in there to, uh, to interview him. And the police aren't assisting either. Is there no way you can you can get a court to overturn no, that? No, because um, we've no jurisdiction. Um, there's certain information we need. The police have got. Once we get it, then then we can get into the prison. But they're they're just being horrible and not well, fingers anything. crossed. And I'm sure you ain't yeah. going to stop pushing for that. Yeah, I really believe yeah. that um, the methods that you're using and and the way that you're targeting the this is is from pure heart. Yeah, yeah. and um, determination to try and change the way if, this all is and and to, to if, if the police aren't going to do it and then let us do it yeah you know giving people a voice and that's amazing yeah you, you know they're, 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 there's groups that go out there um i know a group of sikhs that go out there and and save children from trafficking kids that have been groomed into yeah. and they're going out and actively but what they're doing is that they're working with the police when i say working with the police they're informing the police of their intelligence and sharing the intelligence and saying, come with us. And of course, the police are doing nothing about it. So they're doing it. And they're doing it in a legal framework. Mm -hmm. So so everything I do, I never advocate law-breaking. Mm -hmm. um, I'm probably at most, I'm prepared to do civil trespass, and that's about it. I won't go any further. I've just had um, uh, one guy that we know, he actually is now doing 17 years for kidnap because he went out and, and took a kid that was believed at risk and it's backfired and he's now doing 17 years for kidnapping. Wow. So it can go wrong. His way of operating was contrary to, to how I would have done it, but he's a good man, but the system come down hard on him. Um, and this is what we've got to be mindful of. We've got to do everything within the law. Mm. But the law's good. The law's strong. Um, it's when they, they cover things up that it's wrong, you know? Yeah. And if, uh, if you take an example, there was... Um, the the great uh, the great train robbery the Brinks Mac uh, bullion gold thing back in 1983, the police flying squad balls it up, you know they they're, they recoup next to nothing. Um, they did get two people convicted who came out and of course there was I think they ended up murdered or something like that. It's, it's oh, God knows, but it was a big balls up really. It was not successful investigation. However, the banks employed a civilian investigator who recouped scores of millions, something like 24, 30 million quid, this guy on his own, and he managed to get a conviction as well. And he did it on his own, without all these resources of the flying squad, Scotland Yard, the intelligence or surveillance, nothing. He did it just by sort of basic ground work, statement taking and talking to people. Wow. So if they ain't prepared to do it, we'll do it. But do it within the law. Brilliant. You know? And, Absolutely brilliant. And let's watch this space and let's hopefully we'll come back this time next year with some more success. Stories, oh, yeah, amazing. You know? Absolutely amazing. I'd definitely like to do that. Yeah.
but God bless. And it's uh, th- th- these podcasts, Paul, are so important. Yeah, they're the future. Um, until they start regulating you and, and make it too difficult for you to operate, you must continue because they're, they're, they're phenomenal. They're brilliant. They're a lifeline. Yeah, I, I, I get a lot of salvation from it. It's brilliant um, being able to get the message out there because people are listening. They are, they are listening. But, um, you know, we need more people like yourselves that come on to be able to, to help get that message out there um, for the message. And, and, you know, years ago, 40 minutes was maximum for an interview, right? But now people go to the gym and they listen to these. Yeah. They're at work. It's the radio they Driving use the car, yeah. all the time. Yeah. You know, three, four hours isn't a problem. Yeah. And you can see the success of people like Sean Atwood and, and the people he interviews, how, how, you know, millions and millions of subscribers now, you know, and uh, that's how it starts, you know. Yeah. Um, but I will always help where I can always because I think what you're doing is a very good thing. And I'm, Thank you very much. It's a privilege. Yeah. And God Thank bless. You. Thank you. And God bless you and everything that you're doing as well. Again, thank you so much. No worries, my man. Thank you. Absolute pleasure.